Good morning, everybody. And I want to thank you for attending the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs uh, fourth annual suicide prevention summit. Your presence is truly appreciated. So we had to move the summit to an all virtual format due to the recent hurricane that went through our state. Uh, we found it more practical to hold it online in light of the fact that there are some still recovering. Our hearts go out to those who still require assistance. And on that note, I wanna pass it over to Zechariah Brewer, evangelist, City of Refuge to provide the invocation. Zechariah. All right, thank you, Larry. Uh, Lord, I thank you for gathering us here today for the possibility that we still have to uh, gather virtually, even if we're not all together as we originally intended. Uh, thank you for, uh, for everybody who's gonna speak, for everybody who's here to listen, Lord. I ask you to bless this time that uh, we are all here with a similar mission. We are all here with the goal of, of bringing healing and bringing health, bringing life uh, to people. So Lord, I ask you to uh, ask that your name be glorified today. I ask that uh, truth go forth and everything that, uh, everything that you have for us to hear today, let us hear it, Lord God. And bless every speaker, bless every organization that's bringing life today in Jesus name. Amen. Zachariah, thank you so much. It's truly appreciated. <clears throat> uh, I want to put out a few admin notes before we get started. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs YouTube page. So everybody will be sent an email that contains the link um, for this uh, summit for later viewing. Uh, for questions, I want everybody to please use the Q&A box. Um, if you have a question for a vendor or a question for one of the speakers, please use the Q&A box only to ask a question for the vendors or the speakers. Uh, myself and our communications director, Brandy Patrick, will be monitoring the Q&A box to uh, get those questions answered. And thank you, Brandy, for your assistance. Now, the chat box. I already see some people in the chat box uh, posting good morning and posting their name and I truly appreciate it. Since we can't do this in person, our only way of networking is to use the chat box. So if you wanna use the chat box to post your name, the organization that you work for, uh, your contact information, that's perfectly fine. I can tell you uh, right now we had 73 attendees and a lot of the attendees that are on this call work in the realm of uh, suicide prevention. So uh, please feel free to post your organization, post your name, because that, that's truly the only way we can figure out who's who um, at this summit and also for us to network um, together. This summit is designed to ensure that we all leave the event as better suicide prevention advocates than when we arrive. The goal is to provide effective training and thoroughly deliver instruction that will increase our understanding of suicidal ideology and how to assist those in danger. We will look, uh, we also look at what efforts and organizations are being utilized in Louisiana to prevent suicide. With that being said, I wanna introduce you all to the Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs, Colonel Joey Strickland. Joey Strickland was appointed Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs by Governor Bell, John Bell Edwards on January 13th, 2016. In this position, he is responsible for overseeing five veteran homes five veteran cemeteries, 74 benefits and claims offices, 33 college and university campus veteran centers, the Military Family Assistance Fund, the Louisiana Veterans Honor Medal Program, and a myriad of outreach initiatives serving veterans uh, organizations, including homelessness prevention, women veterans, and incarcerated veterans programs. His responsibilities include advocating on behalf of Louisiana's more than 277,000 veterans and their families to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Secretary Strickland is no stranger to Veterans Affairs, having served under five Louisiana governors. He is currently the longest serving state Veterans Affairs Secretary in the nation and has served in that position in both Louisiana and Arizona. Secretary Strickland is married to Leela Strickland, an Army brat, they are proud parents of three sons, all Army soldiers, and two twin daughters, one who is an educator and one who followed her father's Army footsteps and serves in the Louisiana Army National Guard. Good morning to you, Colonel Joey Strickland, and thank you so much for being here. 
Good morning, uh, Larry, and uh, good morning, good morning, members uh, of the panel. Uh, as I look across uh, the 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 screen, I recognize so many faces uh, and and friends, and I really appreciate uh, you uh, being here and attending this third uh, Department of Veterans Affairs uh, Suicide Prevention Summit. I wish we could have uh, uh, been together in person, uh, but uh, virtual is, is is better, I guess, than than not having it at all. Uh, suicide is a concern, is a national concern, not only uh, a concern of the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington, but every state across the nation has, uh, has a concern and uh, works to prevent suicide among uh, the veterans population. Uh, in, my, in my own family, uh, I have, uh, four children that served as soldiers. Uh, two of my sons uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, uh, I was concerned about their reaction to the situation in, in Afghanistan because uh, in my own uh, experience, it brought back memories of uh, the US departure from Vietnam. I'm a, I am a combat veteran with two combat tours in Vietnam and 30 years in the U.S. Army. And so uh, my youngest son was really upset about what was happening with the uh, evacuation in Afghanistan. And so I decided as a, as a parent that I better reach out to both my sons and, and just, just talk. And uh, because that's a common reaction, uh, uh, veterans uh, who, who served in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, older veterans who served in Vietnam uh, may feel uh, frustrated, they may feel sad, they may feel grief uh, or distress, they feel helpless because of, of their service and commitment in both of those, in all three of those nations, and yet there are circumstances that they can't control, and uh, they, they may feel angry or, or betrayed. They may uh, experience an increase in, in, uh, in mental health symptoms, like uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress or even, or even depression. And uh, they, uh, they may sleep poorly, they, they may drink more, or they, they may use drugs. Uh, and they do that to avoid uh, reminders or, or media, or they, they, they shy away from social situations they don't want to talk about their experiences and they're, they're angry. Uh, so uh, the concern that, that folks like myself, parents, and certainly as Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, and I, I also chair the National Cemetery Committee for the Federal VA in Washington, and I, I deal with life and death situations almost every day. But veterans may question the, the meaning of their service or whether it was worth the sacrifices that they made. And that's a big, that's a really big thing. Just think about that for a moment. They may feel more moral distress about experiences that, that they had during their service. Uh, they may feel like they need to expect or prepare for the worst. They may become overprotective, uh, vigilant and guarded. They may become preoccupied by danger. They, uh, they may feel a need to avoid being shocked by or unprepared for what may happen in the future. They may think about death and dying a lot more uh, than normal. Uh, I remember in my own combat uh, in two tours in Vietnam, I saw a lot of combat. I was assigned uh, to the 1st Cavalry Division a door gunner on a Huey helicopter for two years. I saw a lot of death and, and dying. And so prior, I just remember prior to serving in combat, I never really thought about death a lot. I, I was young, happy-go-lucky, living my life, looking forward to the future. But somewhere during that experience, I became more preoccupied with uh, death and, and dying, especially when I saw so many of my young uh, fellow soldiers die. And 
as a commander in Germany, uh, I saw young soldiers uh, commit suicide because of circumstances. Um, a lot of it involved personal relationships that uh, they couldn't control or they felt helpless. And so I, I often felt uh, anger that I, I, I wasn't able to reach out to them to talk them out of committing suicide. And I felt a sense of helplessness. And so that's what this summit is all about. It, suicide, folks, is preventable. People do not have to take their lives. There's always a better day the next day or tomorrow. Uh, what looks dark today, tomorrow can be sunlight. But it, it's not an easy uh, process to address. Suicide prevention requires a, a, uh, an approach that is, is tiered. It, it, it requires a public health approach. A, it, it requires combining clinical and community-based uh, approaches. The Department of Veterans Affairs cannot prevent suicide by themselves. Um, uh, we, have to, we have to partner with our civilian community we have to partner with our federal VA community, and we have to partner with service organizations like the VFW and the American Legion and the Disabled American Veterans. Everyone, though, has a role to play in preventing suicide. Uh, and there are some stra strategies uh, for this, and, and this is something that, uh, that I talk to all of my people about. We have 850 employees assigned to this department. Many of them are doctors and nurses. Uh, our, our benefits uh, folks are all veterans. Many of them have experienced combat, suicide situations. And so we talk about suicide prevention constantly in this department. At this moment, it may seem like uh, to a lot of young men and women uh, that served in Afghanistan, for example, that that all is lost, like their service uh, or their sacrifices were for nothing. Uh, but I tell them, and I told my sons, both of them, one of them is retired Sergeant First Class. I said, consider the way that your service made a difference, the impact that it had on others' lives. Consider the impact that your service had on your own life. And the fact that by serving in Iraq and Afghanistan for 20 years, we prevented terrorist attacks in this country. That in itself is a great thing. Remember that now is just one moment in time and that things will continue to change and things will continue to get better. And if we can get that message across to our veterans, both our young men and women, and to our older veterans as well. We will have done a great service. So it can be helpful to focus on the present, to engage in the activities that are most meaningful and valuable uh, to you. Is there something you can do today that is important to you? That's what we have to convey to the veteran. Uh, we can talk about uh, something that is meaningful to them. Uh, uh, we can talk about their, their work. We can talk about their spirituality. We can explain to them that such activities won't necessarily change the past or the things you can't control, but they can help life feel meaningful and they can reduce stress despite the things that they can't control. And it's a constant, it's not a one-time thing, it's a constant conversation. I make it a point when I go around the state talking to young veterans and talking to, you. my daughter is a full-time soldier in the National Guard. She's deployed in support of COVID operations. And I make it a point to talk to these young National Guard soldiers that suicide is not the answer. The answer is, to seek out help, talk to your buddy, 
talk to your uh, to those that your family member that you feel the most comfortable with or your, your command talk to your command your 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 platoon sergeant or your squad leader tell them that you're having some some uh, emotional mental issues and that you need to speak to someone and and I, I tell I tell these commanders if they have a situation like that and they don't know who to recommend the young soldier to or the young veteran to call us we know who to recommend these young people to especially these these veterans not only young people but older people as well because suicide is not just among the young it's among the older crowd as well so uh there's some coping mechanisms that we we need to keep in mind that we can uh talk about uh, we can say uh to the to younger veterans uh and who think about their service in Afghanistan or Iraq was useless, for example. It didn't accomplish anything. Uh, we can always say it did accomplish something. You, you have to keep both the people of, of Afghanistan safe and the people of Iraq safe. And more importantly, you kept the American people safe through your service in those countries. So uh, those are some of the comments that I that I wanted to make. Uh, uh, the good news is that in 2019, uh, there were a total of 6,261 veteran suicide death. And that's not good news, we know that. But there is a light there because 399 fewer suicides occurred in 2019 than in 2018. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into a numbers game because there are just so many numbers there, but uh, uh, suicide prevention remains a top priority for the VA. Uh, the uh, administration, the current administration and the past administration, uh, I don't think this is a political thing, uh, has appropriated the most resources ever uh, to suicide prevention. And I recently had the honor of speaking with Secretary McDonough, the current new secretary, and suicide prevention is going to be one of his top priorities during his uh, administration as federal VA secretary. And uh, I'm heartened by that. And I, I, look, I look forward to working with him uh, on preventing uh, veteran suicides uh, in our state. So with that, uh, I appreciate all the members of the panel, General Cushman, it's good to see you, sir. And uh, thank you, uh, Charlie, Rooney, uh, everybody. I, I just, I, Carla True, uh, I just wanna reach out and, and, and give a virtual hug to everybody. And thank you for being a member of this panel. Uh, Ray Tucker, uh, Zachariah, all of you. Thank you folks for being a member of this panel. Thank you for loving and caring for our veterans and. Thank you for what you do every day. So Larry, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, sir. We truly appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being here this morning uh, to provide your remarks and for sharing your story as well, sir. It's truly appreciated. And also thank you for all that you do for the veterans across the state of Louisiana. Um, you do such great work and we truly appreciate it. Now, the Colonel can't retire until I retire and I only been here two years. So, sir, you, you got a long way to go, you know, but I, I truly appreciate uh, working for you, sir, and uh, for all the work that you do across the state. And thank you so much for being here again. Uh, I, I, I saw a picture of myself uh, 20 years ago when I first retired from the Army, and I had totally black hair. So, you know, it's just <laughs> part of it's, it's a part of life. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the new look, sir. Looks good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you, sir, again. And speaking of uh, the vendors, uh, Colonel Strickland went around and, and thanked the vendors. And uh, we are about to go into the vendor parade. And I used the term vendor, but these are organizations from across the state of Louisiana who assist veterans in one way or another and also assist with the prevention of suicide. And I have to tell you, there are 13 organizations uh, who will introduce themselves and talk about uh, some of the efforts that that, um, they, that they put forward when it comes to veterans and all are amazing. And so I'm definitely looking forward to this vendor parade 
And but I'll let them do the talking about their organization. If you give me one second while I share my screen, and we'll go right into it. Can someone give me a thumbs up that they can actually see this? Are we looking good? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Just give me one second here. And I just had one question. Charlotte, did you wanna say anything before I started um, your presentation or do you wanna say something after? Um, after. Okay. So uh, our first uh, vendor organization, uh, this will be Bridge, for, uh, Bridge Center for Hope uh, and also RI International. And once this uh, quick video is done, the executive director of Bridge Center for Hope, uh, Charlotte Claiborne will provide uh, remarks. Mental illness and addiction can impact anyone, but all too often people experiencing can't see challenges it. can't get the help they need. This is no longer the case yeah. in East Baton Rouge Parish. Is anybody having problems seeing the presentation? Y'all can oh. see it? It's fine with me. Yep, okay. I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can see it. Okay, thank you. All right, Charlotte, I'm just going to go ahead and start it over and we'll be good to go. Mental illness and addiction can impact anyone, but all too often people experience Oh, mine stopped. Just can't get the help they need. This is no longer the case in East Baton Rouge Parish, thanks to a new state-of-the-art crisis receiving center, a place where people experiencing mental health and substance use challenges can get the help they deserve. The Bridge Center for Hope provides individualized treatment that can help people overcome their mental health and substance use challenges and lead healthy and fulfilling lives. Me, Charlotte. Hi, good morning, everyone. Larry, thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Charlotte Claiborne. I am the executive director for the Bridge Center for Hope. Um, in, in conjunction with RI International, that is the service provider for the Bridge Center for Hope. And quickly, I'll just give you, you saw the video. So basically what the Bridge Center for Hope is, is Louisiana's first ever crisis stabilization center. We are designed to provide crisis stabilization services for individuals in East Baton Rouge Parish ages 18 and older. So we do serve the veteran population. We serve your average everyday citizens. The, the intent of the Bridge Center was designed to be able to act as an alternative to the emergency rooms and to the jails. And when we partner with RI International, who is also a, national, a global um, organization that's a nonprofit based out of Arizona that has multiple crisis stabilization centers and over 50 programs also in Australia and New Zealand. And one of the things that they specialize in is the crisis now model. And what that does is it, it takes individuals in that are in a mental health or substance use crisis and they treat them then. So you're not going to a facility where you're having to wait as opposed to when you're in the emergency room, you may have to wait several hours before you're seen. And we also know that if you, for some reason, are escorted by a first responder to parish prison or to any type of jail system, then you're not going to receive those mental health and substance use services um, immediately or at or if in times at all. So what the Bridge Center for Hope does is it provides that stabilization services for anybody in East Baton Rouge Parish, 18 and years and older, regardless of income, regardless of insurance we take everyone so if you don't have insurance or if you don't have income it doesn't matter you will never be turned away we take everyone from 18 and above again if you have tricare if you don't have tricare so we take those barriers out for anyone so there's no reason for someone to say that they couldn't receive services or they didn't know where to go if they're an east baton rouge parish resident the bridge center for hope is funded by a um, millage that was passed in 2018 by the east baton rouge parish taxpayers so that be, that's the reason why we're able to take anyone in east baton rouge parish 18 years and above to provide that service and that treatment for them that's having a mental health or substance use challenge Charlotte, thank you so much. And, and Charlotte, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the only center like this in the state of Louisiana, right? That is correct. We are the only crisis stabilization center in the state of Louisiana. 
Yeah, and actually the first as well. We so, are the first. Yeah, and listen, congratulations. Uh, if you get some time, and this is for everybody, uh, do a little research on Charlotte and the work that they had to do to bring the Bridge Center for Hope together. It was a lot with the city council. Um, where are we gonna get the funds from? Um, that you know, we had they have so many licenses that they had to get in order for this thing to come together. And as I think about it, Charlotte, you guys had a little hold up with some licenses, but then I think you stepped in and said, hey, we'll get the licenses. And the, the, the center came about and everything is good to go. Is that correct? That's correct. And you know, as with anybody who goes first, you have those hurdles and hiccups, hiccups that you arise. And so by us being the only crisis receiving center in the state, you know, you have, they have to kind of check and just, even though it was on the books since 2015, nobody ever applied for it. So you, 2015 and 2020, you know, things have changed. So we just had to be able to check and adjust. And so we were, instead of opening in December where we initially had a plan to launch, we opened on February the 11th of this year. So what I am, I'm, I'm proud to say though, since February 11th up until July 31st of this year, we've seen over 1,065 individuals in East Baton Rouge Parish and provided services for them. 52% of those individuals come in independently on their own, meaning that we have what is called a front door approach. So you can anyone can walk in and welcome. And then the other half has come in escorted by first responders. And that first responders can be law enforcement or can be EMS regardless. And they have their own separate entrance for the facility. Charlotte, thank you so much. I know it's, it's a lot to try to fit in, but uh, it's truly appreciated all the work that you do. And thank you. Thank you. If anybody have any questions, you can always go to our brbridge.org. There's an FAQ section that talks a little bit more in depth and you can see the actual um, units on the facility. Sure. Uh, Colonel, uh, you have a question? Yeah, Charlotte, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about your organization and I'd like for you to make a, an appointment with Larry to maybe come in to the department and let's kind of chat. Sure, not a problem. He has my contact information. We'll get together after this call. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Charlotte. Mental illness and addiction. And I don't think Randall Gomez from Woodlake Addiction Recovery Center has made it on yet, but um, I will make a note. Um, to come back so she can do her presentation. Uh, next, we have Dr. Gayla True from the Vision Project. Dr. True. Hi, thank you, Larry. Uh, thank so you. my name is Gala True and I am with the Veteran Informed Safety Intervention and Outreach Network, which is out of the New Orleans VA, uh, but it's a team of veterans, researchers, and community members, including firearm retailers, shooting ranges, um, individual veterans who are firearm owners, and we're all focused on preventing firearm suicide. So even though we know that the number of suicides among veterans has gone down slightly, uh, the number of suicide by firearm has actually gone up um, a little bit over the past year or so. And especially in our state, uh, about 80% of suicides are by firearm among veterans. So it's a real problem in our state. Uh, and the way that we're addressing this issue is by partnering with firearm owners and retailers um, and other concerned community members to promote evidence-based practices uh, to create time and distance between a person who's in crisis and their uh, firearm. But we wanna do that by having conversations around mental health and firearms before someone's in a crisis and by really having conversations where everyone in our community, family members, veterans, and those who care for them um, know what to say and what to do to help someone um, put time and distance between themselves and their firearms. So we have different pilots that we're doing right now, different pilot programs. One is working with uh, veteran firearm retailers who want to help others in their community and are willing to provide temporary storage for someone who wants to get their firearms out of their home temporarily and voluntarily. Uh, so we're working with um, several firearm retailers right now to pilot that program and measure the impact. We've also been doing tabling at the gun show in Kenner, uh, where we talk about our message and engage people in joining the coalition. 
And our goal is to create a toolkit where anyone can have a table to talk about um, safe firearm storage um, and mental health at any gun show across the state. We wanna be able to have veterans and others doing that across the state at all the different gun shows that are going on on a monthly basis. Um, we've also created a website. It's at the bottom of the slide, www.visioncoalition.net. That is a hub of information and resources for people across the state. Uh, we've gathered some of the best resources out there that come from the VA and others who are engaged in the same effort, but we've tailored everything to our state laws and Louisiana laws um, and really to the culture of, of gun ownership um, and um, you know, really recognizing uh, the culture of gun ownership that, 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 is, that is prevalent for many in our state. Um, and then we're also working to cultivate a network of veterans and others in our community who are educated and trained to talk about firearm storage and mental health um, with others in their community and to provide information on mental health resources. And finally, we just received some funding from the VA to work with military caregivers who are engaged um, through the VA Caregiver Support Program. So working with these concerned significant others so that they can help work on a safety plan with a veteran who may need to temporarily store their firearms um, and really working with those family members who we know are a key piece of the puzzle. So if you wanna learn more, we'd love for you to join the coalition. We have a brief um, kind of intake um, form at our website at www.visioncoalition.net where you can just enter a couple little details and indicate what aspect of what we're doing you're most interested in learning more about and we'll follow up with you. And also my email is at the bottom and Matt Bailey, who is a, um, our veteran um, outreach coordinator. He's really the right hand person in this project and a, and a great person to talk to if you wanna learn more about what we're doing. So please feel free to reach out to me or um, to Matt. Again, the website is www dot visioncoalition.net and it's at the bottom of the slide we'd love to hear from you thanks so much yeah listen dr true thank you so much um always great working with you now dr true was a speaker at last year's suicide prevention summit and she's back again this year but listen thank you so much i see matt and ray are also on the call hello gentlemen and thank you for the hard work that you're doing and i encourage everybody please visit the website a lot of great information uh, with what they're doing in terms of uh, firearm safety and prevention of suicide by lethal means. Uh, very important work, Dr. True, thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll have Ms. Crespo from Violink. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here today with so many passionate people for such a wonderful cause. Um, my name is Sherrod Crespo. I am one of the clinical supervisors at VLink over our 24-hour contact center. I am also our outreach coordinator and our traumatic loss coordinator. Um, and I do perform our trainings on suicide education and response. Um, I wanted to talk to y'all today about our 24-hour contact center and some of our crisis and suicide prevention lines that we have available. All of these phone lines I'm going to tell you about are available statewide, they are free, they are confidential, and they're available 24 hours a day. We do answer the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 1-800-273-TALK. That is really a safe space for anybody who just needs to talk um, about anything that they're going through, whether it be a bad day and you just need to vent all the way to I'm in a suicide crisis point. This is really the safe space to be able to get that connection, to know that you're not alone and talk about what's really on your chest, what's really on your mind, because everybody deserves to be able to be met with compassion and empathy and really express what they're feeling. We also offer this service for teens through a crisis teen text line, which you can text 833-TEXT-TEEN. We also offer a phone and text line specifically for parents in Louisiana, which can be reached by dialing 833-LA-CHILD or by texting 225-424-1533. All of our specialists who answer our crisis lines are trained in crisis intervention, emotional support. They're trained in suicide risk assessment, emergency room diversion, violence risk assessment, duty to warn, and they are all mandated reporters. 
Outside of our contact center, we also have partnered with the Grief Recovery Center, another wonderful nonprofit in Baton Rouge to offer support groups. Um, we do offer a group called Real Talk, which is a group for teenagers in the Baton Rouge area who live with suicide ideation. This group meets weekly on Mondays. It is free to join. For information about that, you could email realtalk at vialink.org. And we also do offer a weekly survivors of suicide loss support group. This group is virtual. It's available statewide for any adult 18 or older who has lost a loved one to suicide. For more information about that group, you can email SOS at vialink.org. We do also offer suicide education and response trainings to whomever wants them, be it just a group of concerned citizens or another agency in the behavioral health field. Um, we can tailor these trainings in-house to your specific needs needs, your specific time frame, whatever is going to work virtual or in person. For more information about that, you can email me. That's my email address, screspo at vialink.org. And please visit our website, vialink.org. It has all of our information about all of our programs. You can also explore our data. We are a 211 information and referral center in Louisiana. We publish our data, all of our resources that we have. And right now, across the top banner of our website, we also have our IDA response resources published there and an interactive Google map for what resources are available in the southeast portion of Louisiana. Um, thank you so much for letting me be here today and for letting me talk to you about the link. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'm available for any questions. Ms. Crespo, thank you so much. Truly appreciate the, uh, the hard work that you do. I know it, it can be very stressful uh, talking to people who are under a lot of stress themselves, and uh, we truly appreciate it. Thank you. And now we'll have Mr. Kerry Ruiz with Stellar and Lighthouse for the Mind, Body, and Soul. Uh, Kerry. Good morning, everyone, and what an honor it is to be here. Uh, and thanks, Larry, for this tremendous opportunity. Um, Yes, I am an accredited Tai Chi for Veterans instructor. Uh, and if you see from my slide above, uh, Tai Chi can be calm in the storm. Uh, I provide Tai Chi services and classes and sessions that help provide benefits as listed above, improve mental health, uh, lower blood pressure, stress and anxiety reduced. And uh, all you have to do is come and your only responsibility is to have fun and experience Tai Chi. And Tai Chi has been considered and called by some as the, the perfect exercise, because not only do you get the physical exercise involved, but you get the mental release of getting into the flow and the meditative piece of Tai Chi. So uh, the continuous movements are appropriate for all ages and fitness types. There's no pressure, no criticism, no corrections. We have a studio here in Baton Rouge, but I also offer Zoom courses as well. And so you, uh, as veterans, you are, avail uh, are, are available to you or complimentary classes for veterans, family and caregivers. So my contact information is carrie at getstellarhelp.com. And my phone number is 225-937-9736. So yes, uh, I can serve the entire state uh, either by Zoom classes or here in town in Baton Rouge. And um, uh, I look forward to meeting with you. And thanks to the Mission Act, Tai Chi is now available as an official community care consult. So uh, if I can be of any service to help you, because our, my experience is the positive reactions from participants with PTSD and TBI and anxiety. So if I can be any help, please give me a call. Thank you, Larry. Hey, thank you uh, so much, Kerry. Hey, it was nice meeting you. I think it's been, what, three weeks now uh, since you yeah. came up to the headquarters building. And Kerry, I would implore you to get with the rest of the, uh, the vendor organizations here because what you're doing for veterans with Tai Chi, um, you know, I think that's very important as, you know, we don't really think about it a lot. And I didn't know about the program until you told me about it. So uh, yeah. I'm quite sure that some of the other organizations and also veterans across the state would love to utilize your services. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, Thank you, Larry. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and now we'll go. Uh, and now we'll go to Chris Flanagan with Hero. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you just fine, Chris. Thank you, Larry, for allowing us to be a part of this summit. Uh, the Hero program 
is a residential treatment program for substance abuse and mental health, which includes personality disorder, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and moral injury. Uh, we were created about three years ago whenever veterans were allowed to go outside of the VA for care. And over the last three years, we've currently helped over 570 veterans, the majority of them coming from the state of Louisiana. But we're also able to work with the outlying states for all of kind of Vision 16, which is a little bit of Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi. Um, uh, and I'm missing in the panhandle of Alabama and Florida. We're, we're really proud and, and thankful that we have this opportunity. And over the last three years, we've really focused on how do we create the best veteran treatment program that exists. And we're proud to say that we're one of just a handful of veteran only programs across the entire country. Uh, one of the things that kind of separates us is we realized that it was really important to create a couple of different tracks. So we have more of like this active conflict com community peer group, which is the, the 2000 ish veterans to present. And then we have a different track more for the seventies, eighties and nineties. Uh, they both had different experiences in the military. There are different ages in their life, different generations, and we were able to deliver better services. When you think of residential uh, it's, it's very heavy on the therapy side of it. So they're getting three groups a day. They're getting at least two one-on-ones a week with a therapist. Uh, as far as the PTSD or the moral injury goes, if they need that kind of work, then we're going to evaluate them to see what sort of therapy will work the best. The best, I'm sorry, and then we'll kind of go that route with them. But at the end of the day, we're really good at the basics. We consider ourselves kind of the beginning of it. Recovery is a process. Uh, it's not just to come to us and then you're better. And, and we really understand that. And we let and we work specifically with the VAs all across this state. And our, our focus is to be that one step, that one cog in the wheel to be able to get them on the path to recovery. Uh, we've had the honor of having a lot of you guys on this, on, on this panel come and visit. We'd love for the rest of you to come and take a tour of exactly who we are. Uh, aesthetically, we're on a nice 22 acre campus. It's definitely an open feel. At any given time, though, there's never more than 38 veterans at our facility, um, which allows them to get that one-on-one -on -one level of care that a lot of them need. So feel free to reach out to me or uh, Dutchie Blanton's also on this call. He's one of our team members, and, and we can set up a time to kind of go into more detail on what we do, how we do, and, and, and why we exist. And uh, again, we're, we're here just like all of y'all to deliver uh, a little bit of help for the veteran community as well as the rest of the state of Louisiana. Thank you so much, Chris. We definitely appreciate all of the hard work that you guys do out in Hero. And, uh, and hello, Dutchie, I know you're on the call as well. Uh, next, we'll move to uh, Vietnam. Uh, before, Larry, before you, before you leave, I, I, just, yes, I just want to give a shout out to the Hero program. I'm familiar with the program I've met the folks involved in that program. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, I, I need another t-shirt from Heroes. I've just worn mine out. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll work on that t-shirt for you, sir. No problem. <laughs> um, next, we'll move over to uh, a, a, Viet, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, very, very interesting um, uh, movie that is coming up. Uh, Mr. Chuck Rooney. Chuck? Thank you, Larry. I appreciate the time here. I'd like to mention to Colonel Strickland, you said that at one time you had black hair and now it's white. I wish I had <laughs> some hair. <laughs> <laughs> but Charles, uh, it's good to see you again, Charlie. Same here, Colonel. Uh, and with me also are Erwin Morant and, and Ignatius De Sandro, who are also uh, Vietnam vets. Uh, we both served in, in, in Vietnam and we both have a lot of experiences that, that we're sharing with each other. And uh, this movie was, was, was brought, up, brought up by Sam Medina, who uh, Sam is not a veteran, but he, he was one of the refugees that escaped Vietnam. And he has great love for the military. 
and he has some stories he can tell you about what happened when they tried to uh, escape from Vietnam. But this this movie is is hopefully to bring awareness to many people out there on the challenges of PTSD, which I have, and uh, bring awareness on, on, on the suicide rates of veterans, which is quite alarming to me. And uh, if we can save just one vet, it's worth it. We hope we can save all of them, but if we can save one, it's just, it's worth it. And it's a movie, it's based on fact. Uh, I'm a, a mentor to uh, Daniel Gonzalez, a Marine who was severely injured in Afghanistan. Uh, who, uh, he, he, he walks now, but it's, he had, it's, it's, a, it's a, a trying event for him to walk, but uh, he, he has survived and he's going on with his life now. Uh, but it was a trying situation. He had some, a lot of challenges with PTSD and, and contemplating suicide. And, and in the film, I'm, I'm his mentor trying to help him get over these challenges and get rid of the demons. And, and in turn, it's helping me also. So once again, uh, we're, we're hoping uh, that, that this film can bring awareness to the general population out there and hopefully uh, save some people from suicide and help them with PTSD. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I have it. I have family members that, that were in previous wars and, and they battled with it. And uh, that's the goal of this film. And uh, once again, all, all the support we can get would be terrific. And uh, if we can help just one person out there, it's certainly worth it. I, uh, I remember speaking with you, but I, I can't remember. How, how, do you, how do you gain access to the film? Is it, is it going to be shown in theaters? Is it on Netflix? Or, or, or how, can you tell us a little bit about that, if, if a veteran yeah. wanted to see the movie? Yes, yeah, Sammy Medina is working on that now. He's he's not finished with the film yet. And by the way, he expressed his his disappointment that he can't be with us today. But he he was one of the evacuees, and he's heading home today. He just found out he had electricity. He's heading home today, and Sammy is working on that. The film should be finished hopefully in November. He okay. would like to have it released on Veterans Day. He's working on on several several uh, different ways to release it with Netflix and uh, theater and so forth. And our goal is to, to uh, be able to show it to vets. Uh, we had talked about this before, Colonel, hopefully at, at some little theater in, in Baton Rouge. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. I remember so, that. Uh, so Sammy is working on that. And by the way, if somebody would like to contact Sammy, his email is contact Sam Medina at yahoo.com once again that's contact sam medina at yahoo.com and my contact is simplify 145 at gmail.com simplify 145 at gmail.com so as soon as we as soon as i get the info on that and a definite uh release date and and the way it'll be released colonel i'll be sure to to contact you and give you the information and i i just saw a little uh, screenshot from ted trump where you guys uh, use the uh, State Veteran Cemetery in Slidell to film. We sure did. We sure did. We shot uh, uh, two or three days over there. And uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, two days at the, at the VA Cemetery in Slidell, and also one day uh, at uh, the cemetery in Chalmette. Yeah, sure did. And, and also, approximately 90 to 90 to 95 percent of the cast are all all veterans we got as many veterans in there as we could Fantastic. and jocko will link uh we have permission to use some of his poems in the, in the film mr rooney thank you so yes. much for your service we definitely thank appreciate you. what you sam and the team are doing uh phenomenal work and, and thanks again sir thank you larry uh linda uh, is up next, Linda Couch with Long Branch Recovery Center. Linda? We're gonna ask you to unmute, Linda. 
Oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I'm Linda Couch. I am the outreach coordinator with uh, Long Branch, and I brought along my CEO Emily Myers. So she's going to tell you a little bit about Long Branch. We have been treating the veterans now for about six months, and are very excited about our new uh, ability to help vets in a lot of ways. So. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Emily Myers. I'm the CEO of Long Branch. I've been with the company since we opened back in 2018. Um, and we've been trying to get into the VACCN for a very long time. So we're very excited that it went active this year and able to um, you know, provide quality care that the client, you know, the veterans and also our clients just deserve. And that's really what we've been, our mission is, is to treat the whole person, the mind, body, spirit, and family and really take a progressive approach with all of our clinical care. So that meaning like providing the best, most um, advanced trainings and things that are evidence-based, all of our staff, all of our clinicians, our master's level clinicians, um, all of our uh, case manager staffs, our CIT credentials, which are substance abuse um, regulate or is part of the substance abuse regulations. And they all have that case manager credential um, and CIT credential in order to work with our clients as well. So every single client that comes into our care gets assigned um, to staff members to them right away, a case manager and a clinician that works with them individually on two different scales. Um, we treat co-occurring and uh, co-occurring with substance abuse being primary disorders. So our co-occurring disorders can range from depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, many different issues, personality disorders as well. And um, we provide uh, longer term uh, residential care and um, step downs as well. So uh, what that typically means our clients are with us sometimes 60 to 90 days, um, and then they step down into an outpatient program. Um, can be with us, it could be with the VA department, it could be with many other IOPs in the area, it just depends on what's proper for the person and what they need. Um, we focus a lot on kind of really uh, trying to figure out the barriers to relapse upon discharge. So what are those things? Is it housing? Is it the family? Is it the, um, is it a employment issues? What are the potential triggers to relapse to really set the person up for success? So they're not in the revolving door of treatment and the hospital system and things like that, because that is a big problem with chronically addicted and chronically mentally ill people is getting them, you know, well, so they're not in and out of the system um, and really getting them to the place where they're functional and, you know, kind of the place that they want to be as a person. Um, and so that's what we spend a lot of time on with our clients. Um, we do offer uh, it, one of the, I think we're the only program in the state that offers a true yoga therapy program. We actually are working with the Department of Veterans Affairs nationally currently to create a pilot program and um, part of create, help our research and develop research with them um, because we've already instituted a yoga therapy program. We have a yoga therapist that's full time, works with the clients individually um, five days a week, as well as group in group, as well as they're getting their full clinical programming from basically starting about seven in the morning until about seven or eight at night. They're in intensive clinical programming in our residential site. We're in Abita Springs. We have a beautiful campus and a home-like setting. Um, that's when I think thing that sets us differentiates us from other places as well, is that we have a very small um, facility. It's about 30 beds total. Um, and I'm very proud to say that over half of our um, population is veterans and we do split our groups as necessary. So if our population tends to be more vets, we will split the group into vets only in those groups. And then we split the groups as well as gender. Um, so we don't gender mix our program as well. Um, so everything is um, separated that way to provide a therapeutic um, environment for everyone that's in the community. Um, we also offer outpatient programming where we have um, intuitive technology is what we call it, but we have wristbands and breathalyzers that um, our clients will wear. It helps track their vital signs and things like that that are ind indicative of relapse, as well as it prop offers um, daily facial recognition breathalyzing. And that is a quick app that you can install on a cell phone. If they don't have a cell phone, they can still use the breathalyzer and we can just you know look at it and things like that later. So um, those are all things that we offer. And um, we also offer your long case management following discharge um, because there's a huge relationship between the amount of time engaged in services and relapses. So we um, offer really, really great case management. They get uh, basically two to four meetings a month. Um, two of those are uh, groups that they're uh, mandated to come to as part of the program, but they can come to every week if they want. It's, it's op open to them as many times as they want to come. Um, 
And we also offer uh, two times a month um, individual case management, but that's kind of as needed. So if some people need more, they get more. If they need less, they get a little less, but usually two is the minimum. So, um, and then we also offer intensive family workshops. Those are three-day family intensives where we can offer to that virtually or in person, depending on pandemics or hurricanes or any of those things. Um, so there's not a barrier to family involvement and care um, and support systems. And, and we mean also family of choice as well, not just you know family that you're married to or anything. So anyone that can be in the family system um, can come to those family workshops. And that's also in our outpatient programming too. We have a huge emphasis on family support. Um, and bringing them into the treatment as well. So they can learn about how to help their family members and support them and the resources that are available. So I think I covered it. Please contact us if you have any questions. Um, we've been very excited to get to know all of you and learn more about um, how we can be a support to, to the Louisiana and um, to the state. And that's our mission is just to improve the care in our state overall. So um, if there's any questions anyone has, I'm happy to answer those in the chat box um, or just call us or email us and we're happy to get in touch with anyone who wants to come see us. I'm very interested in working with Carrie about Tai Chi and bringing that into our program. So I'll be calling you after this. So, um, but thank you all for inviting us and allowing us to share about us and also learn about others because that's really important as well to work collaboratively. So thank you. Emily, Linda, thank you so much for all the hard work. We truly appreciate it. And, and thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. Uh, next, uh, Deanna Charette, Bad Habits Productions. Hi, I'm uh, Deanna Charette. I have 20 years of military veteran in the Air Force and in the Army Reserves. I have been 14 years in the film industry and I've had the pleasure to work with Chuck Rooney uh, before. I started a production company to deal with um, doc, deal with veterans in the obstacles they was documentaries. Uh, but I was almost one of the 22. So um, Sam Medina's film and being a part of this really hits home for me. I also have a 501c3 that will train veterans in the film industry since it's a non-traditional um, job and it's a work as you want to basis. So I will train them in front of the camera and behind the camera with um, many of the local professionals in the field. But my first documentary is on homeless female veterans and I am just looking for my homeless female veterans in different stages at this point. You can reach me at any of, at the email of badhabitsproductions at gmail.com. You can look at my um, website you can call me at 225-288-2215. I have already 15 blanket titles for um, documentaries that I want to do, but I want to expand and I want it to go nationwide up with everything. Uh, so this is very important and to be able to talk to our veterans and get it out to the public so that they can, as the public can, initiate with our politicians to take this forward even more and, and put veterans in the light and get the priority care that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, truly appreciate all of the hard work that you're doing in the film industry. And I would encourage anybody on the call, uh, if you're a veteran or if you know of a veteran that is looking uh, or interested in the film industry, please reach out. Uh, to Deanna, a great resource and a great program that she's bringing to the state of Louisiana and an opportunity uh, for our veterans in the film industry. Uh, thank you, Deanna. And next uh, we have Eric Cousin, military to VA program. Eric? I appreciate the invite. Uh, a lot of great veterans present, a lot of uh, uh, Eric, we can barely hear you, my friend. Uh, we hear you a little better. So uh, I want to say thank you all for uh, uh, Larry for the excitement and uh, all the great presenters are here. It was, uh, that's the great. Um, but I want to talk a little bit. I'm glad to invite us to the center of not over of this program called the Post 9 11 Military Education Management Program. Now, this program is just a little better than the U.S. Armed Forces. Okay. Uh, Eric, I'm, I'm going to stop you one more time, my friend. We're still having a problem hearing you. It's just coming in low. Thank you. Let me try something else. 
But yeah, you're getting a whole lot better. Maybe if you get closer to the microphone. I'm getting on my settings right quick. Oh, no, Eric, you sound good. Whatever you're doing, just stay right there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, you're perfect. So the uh, post 9-11 military and VA case management program is a program that assists eligible veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces, including the Reserves and the National Guard who served in Operation Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation New Dawn, and all post 9-11 veterans were transitioned into the healthcare system of the VA. Uh, we offer some outstanding services. Uh, we help them get enrolled and registered for VA services. Um, most not post 9-11 VA MCVA case management assist veterans to locate and ascertain certain physical, mental, health, and behavioral and social care needs as to ensure a smooth transition into the VA health care system. Uh, we have an outstanding team led by Dr. Rondine Boudreau. She's here, but she's off camera. <laughs> And she's our program manager. And she has a team of clinical social workers such as Ms. Claudia LaRocca, uh, case managers such as Ms. Carolyn Dunbar and Joy Bacchus, and Ms. Judy Johnson, and me, the transition patient advocate. And what we do is we try to help those veterans uh, provide services to convert their system uh, to actually get enrolled into the VA healthcare system. Uh, we actually do referral assistance as well. Uh, if you're a veteran that was discharged from the uh, post 9-11 veteran, we can provide you with medical care for conditions you believe are related to your military service, regardless of your income or your eligibility status, provided you were enrolled with us within the next five years or within your date of discharge. Uh, during this five-year window, your care for anything possibly related to your combat duties may be free of charge. For all other care, you may incur a small co-payment for your visit. If you decide to register or enroll within the five-year window, your opportunity, your eligibility care will depend on your criteria, depending on your income level. Um, as soon as you discharge, we highly recommend you get enrolled in this program. Uh, we do connect those veterans to uh, resources for mental health and behavioral health. Uh, we set them up and monitoring them. We follow your case management until we feel or you feel that you're uh, good to go. And we provide all this information, of course, through the VA, VA Medical System. Now, you might be confused. It says the Veteran Healthcare, Southeast Louisiana Veteran Healthcare System. That's our big old fancy name for the VA Medical System or the VA Hospital. So if you need to get in contact with us, you have our contact information right below. And we look forward to helping any veteran uh, within regards to this medical system, healthcare, I get to transition back into the VA uh, Medical System. Once you come on back to you. Uh, if you have any questions, you have our contact information located right next door or uh, on the side. And we are standing by ready to assist. Thank you. Eric, thank you so much. Very important work um, that you all are doing. All of the transition teams, you know, uh, very important work from our three uh, big VA hospitals here in the state of Louisiana, New Orleans, Alexandria, and of course, uh, Shreveport. But those transition teams, those case management or, or care management uh, teams, they can walk you all the way through the process. You know, you just call them and, and you may not know if you qualify for VA health care or, or how do I register, but just give them a call. And even if they're not in your region, they can point you in the right direction on who you need to talk to. So if you have a question about VA health care, please reach out to Eric and his team and also hello uh, to, to Dr. Boudreaux. And uh, thank you, Eric. And uh, next up, we have Zachariah Brewer, who is an evangelist uh, from City of Refuge and also provided our um, invocation earlier. Zachariah. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to, um, you know, just wanted to put our information out there. Originally, we had a group of uh, young people coming, to, coming along with us from a variety of backgrounds uh, to share their stories. Uh, to share what they've been through, you know, wh whether with uh, depression, with suicidal ideations, with uh, various things like that. And so uh, we will be having, uh, we will be having some Zoom meetings 
uh, in order to be able to just share some of those stories. We'll be putting some of those uh, videos out on our YouTube page. So you see our email address here, uh, C-O-R-M, City of Refuge Ministry, outreach at gmail.com. Uh, send us a message and we can, um, you know, we can include you on that, let you know the schedule for some of those. We also had some resources we planned on passing out that uh, they, they made it to my house. Uh, but, you know, so those are, those are going to be available for distribution. Uh, let us, you know, let us know if you're interested in some of those uh, materials and we can uh, find a way to get them to you, to mail them to you. Uh, so City of Refuge, we're, uh, you know, we have a couple of our folks here uh, as attendees in the chat and they are, uh, you know, they're here as well to just to share some of their experiences, people who uh, you know, the stresses of life almost caused them to lose their mind or almost caused them to uh, take their own lives as well. And so we're here about transforming lives. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, we address the whole person. We want it, we want it to be uh, spiritual needs as well as, the, as well as the physical, mental, emotional side of things. Because I'll be honest, if, if you tell me that uh, what I've got is a mental problem or an emotional problem, then uh, then I interpret that as there's something wrong with me. And, and I fail to see what's really going on uh, beyond that. There's, there's a Bible story that uh, two men were, in, uh, were coming out of their tent in the morning, surrounded by an army. And uh, the younger one uh, got worried about it. And the elder said, Lord, open his eyes so he can see there's more who were for us than those who were uh, against us. And Lord opened his eyes to see that there were uh, angel armies all around him, that the, the natural army, the men standing in front of him was not uh, the extent of everything. And so we want to uh, we want to help y'all. We want the Lord to open anybody's eyes out there to see what's really going on beyond just what you're experiencing in uh, your own self. So reach out to us. We do have a prayer line. Uh, if it's, you know, if you don't get an answer, then leave a message. Uh, we will return your call on that one. And, you know, we're uh, once again planning other uh, other videos, other Zoom meetings and other such things like that uh, to assist people in person or virtually uh, over the phone, over text, whatever's necessary. So thank you very much, Larry. Zachariah, thank you, my friend. Um, always good uh, speaking with you. Um, you know, there is, uh, in my opinion, and, and I'll, and I'll tell you why I had Zachariah as a vendor. Um, our spiritual health is very important. And regardless of which religion you practice, um, I think the spiritual should be fed as well. Zachariah mentioned the whole person concept. And so I think when you start looking at and addressing your spiritual needs, again, whatever your religion may be is fine. Um, you know, that actually helps as well. So thank you, Zachariah, and we appreciate the hard work that you all are doing at the City of Refuge and other uh, spiritual leaders as well across the state of Louisiana. Thank you so much. And as we come down to the end of our vendor program, uh, James Burris, I know that you're on. And uh, right now, well, hold on, maybe you've been promoted. I'm, I'm here. Okay, good, James is here. So. Uh, we have uh, two vendors left, and next up is uh, Marine Corps veteran uh, Renard Dominic. Renard, are you on? I am. How you doing, Larry? Thank you, sir. Doing well. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, hello. Hey, my name is Dr. Renard Dominic. I'm the residential program manager over at Bastion, which is an intentional living facility. Um, we're located over in the Gentilly Woods neighborhood in New Orleans. Uh, that's about maybe a mile from Bayou St. John, and refer uh, re reference you're looking for a reference is about 10, 10 minutes uh, from the VA Medical Center right there on Canal Street. And so our model is a community-based uh, intervention model where we handle foundationary needs uh, for individuals such as their uh, you know, uh, safety, living, uh, living conditions. One thing how we're expanding this is uh, to meet these foundationary needs is we are addressing hungerness, we are addressing crisis management. I mean, Bastion is basically a blank canvas. Um, currently right now, our veteran population that currently lives there is a roughly about 70%. The reason why it is not 100 is because of fair housing, um, fair housing laws. We can't just specifically target uh, veterans. It has to be uh, you know, a, a variable po uh, population. However, we do have civilians on site uh, that render awesome, 
awesome activities from art. Uh, we, uh, we have a retired teacher who lives on staff uh, uh, that does art um, and just, and just a, a copiate facet of individuals who bring a lot to the table for the veterans who actually live uh, on, on site. Moving forward, so uh, we uh, partner with a lot of other organizations to meet the needs of our veterans. And this is just financial uh, literacy, banking, banking liter liter uh, literacy and uh, independence. Uh, we do have a, uh, a network of uh, crisis manage management providers. We have a network of substance use providers. Uh, moving forward, so how we're actually uh, uh, transforming Bastion is uh, developing learning models for residents and everybody that they can use. And one learning model that particularly that we're developing for this Suicide Awareness Month, which is in September going on right now, is this uh, hybrid of an experiential and this vicarious learning model to really show individuals the understanding of the impact of suicide. And one thing when we develop this curriculum and, 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 this, and, and this intervention uh, aspect is, you know, how, how can you experience suicide without directly experiencing it? And we put together something that is absolutely very comprehensive and that we're definitely looking to pilot and see how this actually works. Uh, and getting to different organizations. But basically, again, to kind of recap, and my information isn't on it, so I'll definitely post this in the chat, is uh, we're just an intentional community that is, uh, you know, community-based intervention strategies where we just uh, focus on the foundationary aspect of living, where we can hopefully, at the end of this, empower individuals to take a hold of their life and really live their life how they want to live it to the utmost of that possibility, whatever that is. And that's just an embody embodying a more aspect, a humanistic aspect of care, which, which kind of is lacking. Um, I'm, I'm starting to see uh, being retired only two months out of the military now. So uh, I'll definitely put my contact information uh, in the chat. And yeah, thank you for having me uh, once again, Larry. I really appreciate this opportunity. Not a problem, my friend. Listen, uh, thank you for attending. Um, and I didn't even know you was a doctor. I mean, you're so humble, you know, uh, but uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your service. And listen, Bastion is a beautiful community. It really is. Uh, you can see from the pictures, but, you know, all of the community vendors that we have on the call today, whether it's, it's Wood Lake or Hero, uh, Long Branch or Bastion, these are beautiful facilities. And the thing about it is when you're talking about substance abuse and addiction, you want uh, the, 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 the veteran or the patient to be somewhere where they're comfortable. And you all are doing a very, uh, amazing work. And uh, please send my hellos, uh, Mr. Dominique, to Lavella and Dylan. Uh, it's been a long time since I saw him, but hey, thank you so much. And uh, last but definitely not least, Mr. James Burroughs, who had to take a phone call earlier this morning, but he is here with us, uh, bring up his slides. So, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stop my share real quick. And uh, James. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm with Covington Behavioral Health Hospital. We have a 28-day uh, comprehensive treatment for veterans and first responders. We have a 24-bed unit that is specific for them. We have uh, our own therapist for that unit. Everybody's certified through the VA and our programming is also certified through the VA. We work directly with them on uh, admitting patients from all across the South, you know, all the way out to Florida. Um, things we treat, uh, we, I'm sorry, we uh, treat substance use disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, military sexual trauma, and other co-occurring conditions. Um, and then we are using the latest and greatest in the models for treatment, including EMDR, CBT, DBT, motivational interviewing. Uh, we're doing family groups, medication management. So we're, we're very happy and proud to be doing what we're doing here. This is something that we started last year in conjunction with the uh, New Orleans VA. And we mimic the program uh, from Gulfport. So their, their physicians came out and their doctors came out and we basically built our entire program off of what they're already doing for the VA, just supplementing with extra beds. And that's pretty much all I've got. James, listen, thank you so much. Uh, we truly appreciate it, my friend. And I wanna thank, um, I wanna thank all of the vendors. Um, truly appreciate 
everything that you all do for the state of Louisiana and probably beyond that. Uh, it is truly appreciated. I'm watching the chat and I see it's a whole lot of questions, um, a lot of comments. And so what's gonna happen is the vendors uh, will stay on as much as they possibly can. If you have a vendor question, uh, you can go ahead and post it in the Q&A um, so that they can get it answered. Uh, they all have access to answer a question in the q and I know some of the questions are going in chat. Uh, that's okay. But if you post it in Q&A, um, we'll take a look at that and we'll have a specific vendor um, standing by to answer that question. Now, one question was posted in the chat. Uh, can I get a copy of the chat? So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the contact information out of the chat and I'm going to put it in a one word document and I'll send that out to you um with a copy of the link uh, after we upload the summit to our youtube so i know it's a lot of contacts in the uh, chat but i'm taking each one of those contacts out and i'm consolidating them into one document so you will receive an email with a copy of all of the contacts uh from the uh participants vendors and speakers here today at the summit and also you will receive uh the link to our louisiana department of veterans affairs YouTube page uh, once we have this summit uploaded. Um, our last piece of business, are there okay. actual speakers? Uh, I want to say, oh, go ahead, sir, please. Larry, I, I would just like to make a comment. Uh, I just want to uh, let all of our panelists and all of our uh, vendors uh, uh, know how much you are appreciated by the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs and how much uh, you are appreciated by me personally. I, I, I work and I have worked over the years uh, as secretary of this uh, department to make Louisiana the most veteran friendly state in the nation. I'm determined to do that. And I, I really appreciate uh, uh, Dr. True, the support that we get from you guys at the VA Medical Center in New Orleans, uh, Ray, uh, Raymond, all of you folks just really appreciate the close relationship that we have. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, Mr. Rivera on speed dial if, if, I, if I need something. And, and uh, General Cushman I, with the Veterans Court in Covington, Renard, I, I've known Dylan and Bastion forever. I really appreciate all of you. And I want you to consider that you are partners. If you are partners of no other Department of Louisiana State Government, you are partners with the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs because I need you and, and, and I need your help and your support. Thank you, Larry. You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay, so look, the mute button got me. Okay. No, thank you, sir. I truly appreciate it. And uh, look, I echo your thoughts. Um, so many great organizations here. And uh, Cheryl, you wanted to say something. So I was looking for Randall, but we have, um, Cheryl, can you, can Cheryl come up? Yeah, Cheryl, uh, can you unmute? I'm actually um, virtual. Um, I wanted to hear from Woodlake. Oh, That's you know what? what she yeah, so, was earlier, and I was hoping she would come back on. Uh, so, did you see Randall Gomez log in earlier? No, I did not. I know when her name was up, you said we would come back to her. I was just making sure we didn't forget that. Okay, no, no, um, no. Uh, I, I have a note to come back to uh, to Randall. We've been watching for Randall um that during the entire summit and we'll continue to watch for her and uh if she logs in we'll uh, she'll present for woodlake addiction recovery center yes i appreciate that okay Larry, no problem I, I just texted her to jump back on uh randall yes okay thank you okay so um uh, look, a quick note about the, the vendor parade. Um, when I emailed the vendors and told them, hey, send in one slide, you know, I told everybody, I said, you, you have one minute um, to present. And I think what happened was when I was talking to uh, Ms. Claiborne, 
And I asked her that question and it kind of spiraled into a discussion. That's when the rest of the vendors say, wait a minute, one minute, you know, uh, Charlotte took like two or three minutes. So, but hey, listen, I truly appreciate, I know you guys were on a time crunch, but you presented a lot of great information in a small amount of time. And I know you have a whole lot of other things that you want to say, but thank you for keeping it as short and concise as you possibly can. But the thing is, it is 1020. And I know nobody wants to miss the speakers that we have. So what we're going to do is we will take a seven minute break before the speakers actually come on. Seven minutes, if you want to get up and get a cup of coffee or, or you know, uh, utilize the restroom, because I know nobody wants to meet the uh, or miss the, the speakers, but we, we kind of went long with the vendors, which is a good thing because we had a lot of vendors. So I'm at 1021, we'll reconvene speakers, starting with Dr. Tucker at uh, 1028 a.m. We'll reconvene, but we'll take a quick seven minute break. Thank you. And Cheryl, I'm gonna drop you back down to a, um, to a participant, but thank you, Cheryl, so much. I appreciate uh, the heads up. You're welcome. Actually, Cheryl, the only way I can do it is to kick you out so you can just hang out with us up here. No, don't kick me out. I'm not going to kick you out. You're just going to stay a panelist. So I won't say a word, I promise. <laughs> hey, if you see Randall log in, let us know. <laughs> yeah, she's one, actually what likes one of our contractors here. Um, okay. And I wanted to make sure um, she was able to say something because we fund a part of it for the indigent um, to be able to access uh, substance abuse services. And they're doing a fabulous job over here in Abbeville, Louisiana. So I just wanted to make sure. Um, hey, Randall just logged back in. Uh, thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Cheryl. And yeah, um, there's Randall. Randall. Okay, so we have Randall. So what we'll do is when we come off the break at 1028, um, and thank you whoever sent that text to Randall, I appreciate it. What we're gonna do Randall is, uh, good morning, by the way. Um, we on a break right now because um, we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to refill a coffee and all this good stuff. At 1028, when we come back, I'm gonna go ahead and pull your slide up and I'll introduce you and you can just take it from there. I will say the um, we pretty much broke the one minute rule um, so, you know, if you take two or three minutes, um, it, it's perfectly fine. Um, so just a little background and I will see you at 1028. Randall. Hi. Hey, Cheryl, how are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. I do not want you to miss uh, your time oh, to thank shine. You. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for the kind words, too. We really yeah. appreciate that. We really depend on you guys, and I know you are doing fabulous work here and throughout the Louisiana area, and I wanted to make sure Willick was well represented. So thank you for even being a part of it. Oh, no, thank you. We appreciate it. Yes. So we'll stand by until the break is over. Okay, perfect. All righty. Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna go ahead and resume. I hope everybody had a great break. Um, Randall Gomez is here and Randall represents the uh, Wood Lake Addiction Recovery Center. And Randall, give me one second and uh, I'll go ahead and pull up your, your slide. And can everybody see the slideshow? Yes. Yeah, sure can. Okay, thank you. Randall? Hey, Larry, thank you. So yeah, as you said, my name is Randall Gomez. I'm with Woodlake Addiction Recovery Center. We are a full continuum of care drug and alcohol rehab facility. Um, so, you know, my father started our company uh, and his whole thing is that he wants to treat the curbside to the country club and kind of everybody in between. Um, so we have six locations. Um, we treat veterans at our Ethel campus, at our Denham Springs campus, and then we have an IOP in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where we treat them as well. We have um, trauma-specific groups for, and those veterans automatically qualify for that group. Um, and Lauren Cooper is who runs that group with us. Uh, and then we have a veteran-specific house in Baton Rouge as well, and that's off of Old Hammond Highway. So it's not far, it's about a mile away from um, our IOP. We're in network with all major insurances, um, and then, and we, you know, we have our, our Ethel campus, we have 60 beds out there, uh, and they stay about 60 days in the residential program out there, and then they'll come to the IOP and continue their treatment in the um, outpatient setting. So that was my little spiel. I think I, I might've been one minute. Look, Randall, you, you was the only one. That was one minute. Oh, good, I'm proud. <laughs> you get gold stars. Yeah, there you go. Randall, listen, thank you so much for the uh, hard work. We really enjoyed it when you came up to the uh, to the headquarters and uh, talked about Wood Lake. And, and um, we really appreciate the insight um, on your facility. And I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, on this summit, uh, the vendor organizations are Wood Lake Recovery Center, um, Hero Program. We also have Long Branch Recovery Center, and then uh, Bastion, which not necessarily a recovery center, but a place where veterans uh, uh, actually live on the campus, and also Covington uh, Behavioral Health. I really appreciate the way you all uh, work with each other um, and, and to provide the best services and care available to veterans who are suffering uh, from substance abuse and addiction problems. And, and thank you all so much. And with that, uh, the vendors, you may turn your cameras off. Uh, to the speakers, I would like you to please turn your cameras on. So our speakers uh, for this year's summit include Dr. Raymond Tucker, Assistant Professor uh, Clinical Psychology at Louisiana State University, Lori Guillory, Vision 16 Suicide Prevention Lead, SLIVICS, Latasha Kelly, um, Retired Army, SMVF Program Monitor at the Louisiana Department of Health's Behavioral Health uh, Unit, and General Michael Cushman, Air Force retired and military advisor to the 22nd Judicial District Court here in Louisiana. Thank you so much speakers, I truly appreciate it. And with that, we'll all turn our camera off and we'll leave uh, Dr. Uh, Tucker's camera on. And Dr. Tucker, the floor is yours, sir. Great, it looks like uh, uh, screen sharing uh, is disabled uh, for everyone but you. You want to screen? You want to share your screen, sir? Yeah, if that's okay. That's not a problem. Give me one second, please. Thank you. And speakers, do you all have presentations? I wouldn't try. I know Laurie, you have one. Laurie, if you want to, if you guys want to share it, that, that's perfectly fine. I didn't know if you were going. I will want to share when it's my turn, Larry. Thank you. Okay, yeah, no, look, not a problem. Uh, go ahead and try it now, Dr. Uh, Tucker, please. Looks good. Okay, 
Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you all. It's an honor uh, to be with you, you all here today and what you're doing to prevent suicide uh, with our veterans and our local community. I'm excited to talk to you all about what suicidal thoughts are and uh, what they aren't. We know we lose about 45,000 people to suicide each year. That's one person every 11.7 minutes. I like to talk about suicidal thoughts and behaviors like a funnel, though. We lose 45,000 people to suicide, but the CDC estimates that about 3.5 million Americans plan their own suicide each year. And the number grows to 12 million people having active suicidal thoughts, thoughts like, I want to kill myself, I should kill myself. And many of our prevention initiatives to prevent uh, suicide in active duty and veteran communities rest on understanding who is having suicidal thoughts, things like the ACE initiative for active duty uh, military personnel, but uh, even clinical interventions like ASSIST and the Columbia Suicide Rating Scale, much of whether or not people get additional suicide prevention help rests on whether or not somebody is or is not having uh, suicidal thoughts. And so if this is such a major component of our prevention strategies, I think we really need to understand what suicidal thoughts actually are in nature. So that's my goal uh, for the brief uh, mo moment here. First, I don't think we always uh, recognize, but suicidal thoughts are both verbal, our thinking, but also pictorial or images. This is a study of 15 adults who had recently attempted suicide. And they asked uh, questions like, have you ever had a time where you thought of or had images of things like a time you tried to harm yourself in the past or that you, uh, what might happen if you died or, um, or what might happen if, uh, to other people if you died? If you look at this column, you'll actually see that more adults had images of these things than actual sort of verbal thoughts. But often when we're asking people about suicidal thinking, we're asking about verbal thoughts. Very rarely are we asking questions around what we call suicide flash forwards are these images. But certainly suicidal thinking has a sort of pictorial or an image component um, as well. Uh, suicidal thoughts are actually non-conscious as well. Again, when we ask about thoughts of suicide, we're asking about conscious sort of mulling over suicidal thinking, but it looks like there's non-conscious processes here too. This is actually my dissertation uh, study following up on some great work done out at uh, Harvard by Matthew Nock, uh, taking something called the affect misattribution procedure that gets at sort of implicit or non-conscious um, sort of connection to material or sort of attitudes and uh, seeing if that, that sort of connection to suicide uh, exists in folks. I think the best way to explain this study is actually just showing you a, a sort of example. So if I created an SEC conference version of the affect misattribution procedure, this might be what it looks like. I might have you sit in front of a computer screen and I'll quickly show you a picture for a hundred milliseconds. So fast, if you blink, you'll miss it. It might be something like our great Mike the Tiger. And then after that, I'm gonna show you a picture that you don't really know that what it means. So if you don't know how to read Chinese pictographs, you don't really understand what um, this pictograph might mean. I'm getting a lot of feedback there from somebody. Um, so if you don't understand what this Chinese pictograph means, it doesn't necessarily make you feel happy or sad. So I ask you very quickly after, if you found that Chinese pictograph to generally be pleasant at your gut, gut reaction, was that a pleasant image or unpleasant? What we find is people's sort of emotional action after seeing Mike the Tiger gets misattributed or put on that uh, Chinese pictograph. So we're more likely to say it's pleasant. However, other images, I don't know, let's say like Alabama's uh, Crimson Tide logo may actually give us a very different uh, affective reaction. And some research has shown that people can actually predict who uh, will vote for certain political candidates by putting pictures of those political candidates here and then having them rate those images. It's actually a pretty amazing task. So this is what it would look like in real time if you were doing this on your computer screen. I just want you to see it. Very quick, huh? So you have to do your gut reaction. And here's another version. So this is our task. And what I did was change those pictures instead of LSU or Alabama. I, I made uh, images that were uh, people who had died by suicide or in the process of, of killing themselves. Negative images that weren't necessarily death related, but things like cockroaches crawling on a piece of pizza. And then positive images uh, instead. And what I found, uh, what I also asked people to do is instead of rating how 
you know, pleasant that Chinese pictograph is. I asked him if I, if we were to put that on a t-shirt for you to wear around, would that t-shirt be like you fitting of you? Do you have a connection to that t-shirt? And so, um, if I were walking around with a t-shirt on campus, this might be, um, some of my personalized t-shirts. It's a funnier joke when we're not virtual, but I am quite short. So that, uh, that does make sense. I promise. So what we're look, looking at is that implicit connection to suicide or death. And what I found was, um, based on how people rated those Chinese pictographs after the suicide pictures, I could correctly classify 86.5% of 120 people into who were having suicidal thoughts in the last two weeks and who weren't. And this replicated uh, some really great work um, out at Harvard that's starting to demonstrate that those suicidal thoughts can be sort of under conscious control as well. Um, certainly something we want to be aware of around suicidal thinking. Maybe the study that's changed my research the most in the last decade is um, showing just how dynamic and quickly to change suicidal thoughts are. It's actually from that same group out at Harvard. They gave cell phones to people who left a psychiatry inpatient unit um, after a suicide attempt or, or came in for suicidal thoughts. And every four to five hours, they simply asked them, how much do you want to kill yourself right now? And they did that for 28 days, four times a day. And what you can see in this graph is actually each person's sort of individual data. So this person in purple, you know, starts a little bit below zero, but, you know, a couple of days later, they're having this big spike where they're above zero for su suicidal desire, and certainly a lot of peaks and valleys. Same with the person in blue. A lot of peaks and valleys is a good time here, not very much suicidal thoughts, but by the end of this week, they're having a ton of variability where in four hours, they could be the most suicidal they were all study, and then four hours later, be back down to zero. And we actually saw that for the intention to kill oneself as well. How likely are you to kill yourself soon? That same variability was there. So what we learned from this study with sort of high risk folks is knowing about suicidal thinking right now might not mean a lot for the intensity of their suicidal thoughts four hours from now. And certainly something we didn't anticipate that much level of variability. So suicidal thoughts, they're verbal, they're pictorial, they're non-conscious and they're very dynamic. But I think we also, to understand suicidal thoughts, need to talk about what they aren't, because this is two myths that I think really need busting in suicide prevention, especially around our preventative, like our community prevention, but also our clinical prevention. The first is suicidal thoughts are not contingent on depression. Uh, when I'm asked what's the biggest myth about suicide we have to get rid of, it's that suicide is just a bad case of depression. And some really great work done out, up in Kaiser Permanente's uh, system of care up in the Pacific Northwest uh, tracked almost 700 adults who are getting depression treatment for 16 weeks. And they looked at every two weeks, what happened to their depression symptoms and what happened to their suicidal thoughts, trying to understand, you know, how often does depression scores go down, but actually suicidal thinking, the severity may actually go up. And so that's what this graph actually shows. So this oddly looks like our state capital here with this uh, zero being the, the highest bar. That bar shows that for the vast majority of people, when their depression symptoms went up or down over two weeks, their suicidal thoughts went that same direction. So if depression went up, so did suicidal thinking. On the left side, however, were times where suicidal thoughts severity went down over those two weeks, but depression symptoms actually had gone up. They got worse. And on the right are times where um, individuals' depression symptoms went down but their suicidal thought intensity actually increased. In fact, 13% of patients experienced over the course of those six weeks at least one time in which their suicidal thoughts got worse when their depression symptoms actually got better, which clearly shows um, that we cannot rest our hats on improving depression symptoms to reduce people's uh, suicidal thinking. And finally, what suicidal thoughts aren't, they're not good predictors of actual suicide, which is a tough pill to swallow, uh, especially uh, as a clinician. This is what we call a meta-analysis. If you're familiar with these studies, basically you take all of the existing research already done on one question, and instead of having you know, a study on 60 people, 80 people, 200 people, you take all of these studies and you collapse the data together, you, you jumble it up. So now you've got thousands of, of data points that you can work with. And this, is, uh, this group of uh, researchers did that for how well does knowing if somebody is having suicidal thoughts today actually predict eventual attempts or death weeks, months, or years later. 
And uh, it, this, was not, this was not good at all. So let me read you um, just a part of the abstract. They write, the main finding is limited sensitivity of suicidal thoughts for suicide, such that approximately 60% of people who go on to die by suicide have not expressed suicidal thoughts at an earlier time point. In fact, they go on to look at the predictive metrics, the actual analysis, and show adding suicidal thoughts to a coin flip actually wouldn't have improved the eventual prediction of suicide attempts and death. What I don't want you to hear is that we shouldn't be concerned when our loved ones have suicidal thoughts. But what I hope um, this makes clear is that knowing that question is not as strong of a predictor of who goes on to act on suicidal thinking as we may actually hope it is. So what suicidal thoughts aren't, they're not contingent on depression. And very unfortunately, they, they're not great predictors who will go on to attempt and die by suicide. So what does this all mean for suicide prevention? Well, I know speakers coming up are going to talk a little bit about this, but let me hit on two major points I'd like you to take away. The first is identifying people who are having suicidal thoughts just cannot be the end-all approach for suicide prevention, whether that's in our community, whether that's clinically, whether that's with our loved ones, that that moving target moves too fast. There's too many reasons why people may not talk about suicidal thoughts, that if suicide prevention initiatives rest on if somebody says yes, then they get additional suicide prevention work. If they say no, then okay, we're okay, we don't need it. That is a moving target that isn't really going to move the needle in reducing suicidal behavior. There are things out there that do, though, that don't rely on suicidal thoughts. For example, um, analysis showed that for every dollar a state increases its minimum wage laws, you see a 2% reduction in the state suicide, uh, suicide rate. So things like uh, uh, legislation around um, uh, minimum wage laws may help. Certainly, uh, mean safety strategies, which were talked about uh, by Dr. True, really great work going on about creating a culture around safe storage practices can delay somebody's uh, decision to attempt suicide and die by suicide by the most lethal means of suicide that we have. However, we have to do that competently as people will use firearms to you know, protect their home. And over periods of acute stress, we may be able to help people use something else uh, whether that's uh, something like a noxious pellet gun to protect their homes while they safely store their firearms or potentially even take that uh, firearm out of the home completely. And lots of other legislation out there to help with these things, but at a community level, creating a culture of temporary removal of firearms and safe storage practices, um, certainly important when 80% of veterans in Louisiana die by suicide by firearm. So as Mr. Strickland absolutely stole my thunder earlier, and I'm so glad he did, uh, suicide is everyone's business, whether we're a clinician or whether we, uh, we vote. Uh, some of the things that we can do day-to-day uh, -day can get ahead of the suicide prevention problem without having to identify whether or not people are having thoughts of suicide. I will put my email in the chat, but I'd love to hear from y'all um, with any questions. Dr. Tucker, uh, thank you so much. Truly appreciate it. And a lot of great information um, that you presented to us this morning. I know it takes a lot of work to, you know, not only collect this data, but also the way you presented it um, was just, that to me, it was well received. And thank you so much for the hard work that you're doing. And listen, I completely forgot to read your bio. Dr. Tucker is another humble person. I, I said, hey, Dr. Tucker, can you send me your bio? He sent me two sentences. And I said, sir, you know, um, you know, your bio is kind of, you know, what's going on with you over the past like 20 years? Oh, no, I don't have time for all of that. But anyway, uh, Dr. Raymond Tucker has worked with um, VA suicide prevention teams at the Oklahoma City VA and the Seattle VA and has published, published over 90 investigations on suicidal thoughts and behaviors in current and former military service members, as well as civilians. And of course, Dr. Tucker currently works at LSU as an assistant professor in cl uh, clinical psychology. And you probably do a lot of research as well at LSU. Is that correct, sir? Uh, absolutely. We also um, have a suicide prevention consult team at Our Lady of the Lake um, here in Baton Rouge as well. So um, I'm also part of the psychiatry team there. Very well. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this summit. And, and we truly appreciate it. If anybody has a question for Dr. Tucker, please uh, post that question in the Q&A. As of now, I don't see any. Uh, so we will move on to, well, uh, get, uh, Mr. Dominique, go ahead and uh, post it in the, uh, the Q&A. And uh, we will definitely answer that question. All of the panelists 
and vendors have the ability to type an answer to your question. So if you um, post your question in the Q&A, the panelists or the vendors can go ahead and type that information in there. And I just say, well, somebody answered that question already. So it's already answered. So at any rate, if you have a question, just use the Q&A and type it in there and, and we'll definitely answer that question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tucker. Uh, uh, Colonel, did you have anything? I just want to uh, thank Dr. Tucker and tell him that he is now part of the Department of Veterans Affairs. <laughs> thank you so much. That's an honor. Okay. Uh, up next, we have uh, Laurie Guillory. Mm. So uh, Laurie Guillory is a licensed mm. clinical social worker, board approved clinical supervisor who works in the Southeast Louisiana VA healthcare system, or SLIVIX for short. She is the Recovery Engagement and Coordination for Health Veterans Enhanced Treatment Program Coordinator. She is also a suicide prevention social worker and VISN 16 suicide prevention team lead, a very hard worker and, and, and just an advocate uh, for suicide prevention. Laurie Guillory, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if I can get it going. Can everyone see this? Yes, Laura, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So, so today I'm gonna to talk about um, the VA's SAVE training. I pulled a piece of it out because I don't have an hour to talk today, just a, just a few minutes. Um, and so <clears throat> the first thing I'm gonna talk a little bit about, and I know Dr. Tucker already talked about some myths, but I'm gonna talk about a few more. One of them is uh, people who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. Um, this is a myth. What we do know is no matter how casually or jokingly said, suicidal threats should never be ignored. Um, and they may indeed indicate serious suicidal feelings. Someone who talks about suicide, they provide us with the opportunity to intervene before suicidal behavior occurs. And we'll talk about some of the ways to, to do that intervening in just a moment. So another myth is the only one who can really help someone who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or therapist. Um, so mental health therapists and counselors were not magic. Um, special training is not required to safely raise the subject of suicide. Um, helping someone feel included and showing genuine heartfelt support can also make a big difference during a challenging time. So just kind of being there and being supportive can, can go a long way. So the steps of our, of our VA SAVE, so I'm gonna talk about what SAVE even stands for. Um, <clears throat> our training, it's trying to teach communities how to help veterans um, at risk for suicide. VA SAVE will help you act with care and compassion if you do encounter a veteran who is in a suicidal crisis. So SAVE actually stands for signs of suicidal thinking that should be recognized asking the most important question of all, and we'll get to that question in just a moment, validate the veteran's experience and encourage and um, encourage treatment and expedite getting help. So that E is actually two E's. Um, so the first, the first part of SAVE is the S and that's signs of suicidal thinking. We wanna learn to recognize some warning signs. And I know Dr. Tucker kind of just um, <laughs> said that sometimes this isn't all that true, but we're still going to look for some of these signs. Um, hopelessness, feeling like there's no way out. A lot of times folks will talk about, um, you know, being at the end of their rope or, or not having very many options or no options left or um, having that kind of thinking. Anxiety, agitation, sleeplessness, mood swings, all of these things can be signs. Um, I know so many veterans talk about sleeplessness and um, that can be a symptom of, of many things, but it, can, it is certainly correlated with suicide. Um, feeling like there's no reason to live. I hear that a lot from veterans that I talk to that are um, experiencing this, this suicidal thinking, you know, feeling like there's not a good reason to go on. Um, rage or anger, kind of emotions out of control. Um, engaging in risky activities without thinking. The next one talks about alcohol and drug use. So alcohol and drug use, um, sometimes 
<clears throat> driving too fast or spending too much money or just kind of things that are out of control. Um, and then withdrawal from family and friends. Um, that's pretty concerning as well. So uh, other signs, um, thinking about hurting or killing themselves, looking for ways to die, um, talking about death or dying or suicide. And then again, that self-destructive or risk-taking behavior, especially when it involves alcohol, drugs, or weapons. Um, weapons are very concerning. So A, ask the question. So we know we want to know how to ask the most important question of all. Are you thinking about killing yourself? If somebody answers that yes, then of course we want to take action. If they say no, but we see some of that other behavior, we still want to be concerned, right? So we, we may still try to engage this veteran in, um, in care, whether it's you know, VA care or some kind of care. We have lots of community providers that have talked today, including that program in Baton Rouge. Um, so we want to help, help veterans get connected where they need to be connected. So asking the question, we want to ask um, the question if you've identified any warning signs or symptoms and ask the question in a neutral way that flows with the conversation. For people who um, maybe are not mental health providers, you feel like that can be really awkward. Um, so I'd like you just to practice it later today. Have you thought, have thoughts of killing yourself so that you can ask that question if you ever needed to. Um, so we don't want to ask the question as though you're looking for a no answer. You aren't thinking of killing yourself, are you? Or that way, or make it, you know, feel like it's less important. Um, and we also don't want to, is somebody asking me a question? Okay. No, um, go ahead, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we don't want to wait. Also, we don't want to wait to ask the question when somebody's heading out the door. It, it doesn't mean to, we don't want it to be an afterthought. We want you to, to actively engage in asking that question. Um, so V, we want to validate the veteran's experience. We want to be able to talk openly about suicide and be willing to listen and allow the veteran to express his or her feelings. Um, so sometimes what we want to do is ask that question and then hear what the veteran has to say back to us um, and not pass judgment, not um, try to interrupt and tell the veteran everything's going to be okay. We don't know what's going on for them. So we want to listen and, and allow them to talk about what is going on. Recognize that the, seri the situation is serious. Again, don't pass judgment. We want to um, be open to hearing what whatever's going on and reassure the veteran that help is available, right? We don't wanna say everything's okay. What we wanna say is let's get you the help that you need. Let's help you connect where, um, where you can get the help that you need. So encourage treatment and expedite getting help. So what should you do if you think someone is suicidal? Please don't keep that a secret. Please don't leave him or her alone if they're with you. Um, don't hang up the phone with them. If they're on the phone with you, you want to try to get them immediate help from his or her doctor from the emergency room. You can call 911 um, if they're, you know, if you're worried right in the moment. We want to reassure the veteran that help is available. You can even call the Veterans Crisis Line. Um, I know earlier you talked about the National Helpline. It is the same number. And when you call it, you press one to get to the Veterans um, Crisis Line. <clears throat> So when talking with a veteran who might be at risk of suicide, what we wanna do is remain calm. We wanna listen more than we speak, um, maintain eye contact if you're in person, act with confidence, don't argue with them. Don't say things like, oh, you're not really thinking that. You're not really, um, things aren't really that bad. Please don't argue with, with them. Um, we wanna use open body language, which means don't sit there with your arms crossed or um, making scowling faces. Um, we want to limit questions and let the veteran do the talking. I know I talked about that a little bit before. Use supporting, supportive, encouraging comments. Um, things like, you know, we can get help. Um, I believe that things are really difficult for you right now. You know, things like that. Be honest and let the veteran know that there's no quick solutions, but help is available. You know, I know this is a really difficult time for you. Um, let's see about getting you connected where you can get connected and start working on um, what can help you feel better. Something like that. So if they're on a, on a phone call with you, you want to keep the caller on the line 
try not to hang up or transfer them away. Um, again, please remain calm. Identify, obtain identifying information from the caller, things like their name, phone number, and current location. Um, a lot of this is kind of geared to some of our internal staff, but it can work for anybody anywhere. You can conference call to the Veterans Crisis Line, um, but don't hang up until you're connected with them. Um, you can ask a coworker for, for help via some kind of messaging if you have that in your office or waving your hand and, and, and getting somebody's attention. Um, if the caller does disconnect, we want you to call 911 and or the, the Veterans Crisis Line. That's why we want to have gotten that contact information earlier, right? Name, phone number, current location, so that we can send 911 or we can um, give the crisis line the veteran's phone number so that then they can reach out to the veteran because they will do that. They will call um, veterans. If, if we call and say, I'm really concerned about this person and they just hung up with the phone on me, um, but here's their phone number, they'll actually initiate a call back to that veteran. So practice, con practice doing this kind of stuff. Practice conference calls. Um, at your desk with coworkers, make sure you know how to do it in the event that you ever had to in crisis. Because what happens a lot of times whenever you're in this situation is you get anxious too. And so you wanna know what to do um, if you needed to, to transfer a call or to try to get help from a coworker or anything like that. Um, so here's some resources and references. So there's a, an online training this um, organization, Psych Armor, there's a course to, um, developed in collaboration with the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, it's a 25 minute course. And after that, you'll be able, you'll, you will develop a general understanding of the problem of suicide in the United States, understand how to identify a veteran who may be at risk for suicide and know what to do if you do identify a veteran at risk. So the, um, the email, um, not the email, the website is over here, www.psycharmorinstitute.org. So that's a, a good place to get more resources. And then also free confidential support is available through the Veterans Crisis Line, Military Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255. And it's available to veterans, service members, family members, friends. Um, if you're, you know, some kind of provider in the community and you've had an experience that you're concerned about, you can call as well. Anybody can call and ask for help. That's the end of my show. I feel like I talked so fast. Oh, listen, Laurie, thank you so much. <laughs> um, Laura, you provided a lot of great information. Uh, and, and the great thing about that presentation is those are things that we can do right now. You know, we don't have to train, we don't have to wait. We can uh, implement this information now. And so I truly appreciate it. Laurie, you definitely work hard down there and, and all of the work that you do, um, it goes towards uh, preventing suicide and we truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Latasha Kelly. So uh, Latasha Kelly is a retired army combat veteran who among other positions has worked for Volunteers of America serving homeless veterans. Uh, she is currently the program monitor for the service members, veterans, and their families program at the Louisiana Department of Health's Office of Behavioral Management. She also is the state team leader for Louisiana Governor's Challenge to Prevent Suicide Among Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families, which in itself is like a full-time job. Uh, because, Latasha, how many, how many people on the team that you lead? Um, it's growing and growing. I say we have 40 plus right now. 40 plus people across the state of Louisiana that are, are part of the Louisiana Governor's Suicide Prevention Challenge. And Latasha Kelly is our fearless leader. Uh, so Latasha, I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's an honor to be a speaker. Um, and I just want to say like, I, I'm just was so happy to see some of our members that are already on some of the teams that we have in, the in, in Louisiana with the SMBF collaborative team, which we have like many agencies from across the community, um, also veterans and their families are part of this, a part of this um, SMB collaborative team that also works with us on the governor challenge team. So what I'm gonna do, I don't have any fancy presentation. Um, I just, I'm speaking from the heart. Um, as being a veteran, suicide prevention is something that's very near and dear to me. 
And by working with homeless veterans, working with other veterans, working with their families, is something that we all together have to pull together and combat this because, I mean, it's, it's one, to lose one person is enough. Like, you know, anywhere from 17 to 22 veterans a day is, is too much. So I say one is, one is too much. Um, with the mayor, with the governor's challenge, Louisiana volunteered or we just say would wanted to take part in the governor's challenge for suicide permit prevention among veterans, service members and their families. So in February, Louisiana accepted the challenge to combat suicide prevention among the SMVF population. So a little background about the SMVF um, population and how it deals with the governor's challenge. So the governor's challenge is um, SAMHSA and the VA paired up to come up with different um, policies for each states and cities to provide um, different, you know, there's three different um, subjects that we deal with. And so this, this opportunity is provided for all the states, but so far only 35 states are participating. So um, it is very exciting to see that Louisiana, we decided to take the stand and say, we're gonna stand together and combat this suicide problem that we have. So um, there are three areas that we, we you know, focus on. And one is, um, it's the first identify the SMBF population. And with identifying the SMBF population, we need to find ways to screen them and actually, you know, get them help, like, you know, basically from out of non-care, non-VA care. So um, that's one of the things that we're working on in our group. Um, another thing is promoting connectedness is we want to make sure that once that the SMB population is receiving the care that they need, that once that is over, they're still having follow-up, whether it's by case managers, whether it's by doctors, you know, sending, you know, like, you know, questionnaires to just, you know, see what the person is. So the thing is like, you know, the statement, leave no one behind. So we wanna make sure that everybody's getting the treatment that they're needing. And so the next one um, subject is to focus on increasing lethal means and safety and safety planning. And that's something that everyone isn't, you know, kind of, you know, some people are kind of shy about talking about that subject. So um, with this Louisiana Challenge team, we're looking for ways to make this where it's more acceptable to talk to and such things like it, you know, you may go to like, like say, you know, uh, just say for instance, we go to the emergency department. A lot of times now we're going to urgent care clinics. So we wanna make sure that these clinics and hospitals all know about safety means they can you know, complete safety plans and um, in order to better help this SMVF population. So with that being said, um, Larry is the other co-leader of the Governor's Challenge um, team. Lori is a member of the Governor's Challenge team. Um, and I just want to say that we have so many people who are volunteering to be a part of this. There's so the National Guard, we have the VA, just so many different organizations within the community. I can go, the, the list goes on and on. And so by seeing like some of the vendors that I saw this morning, I seen that a lot of them fall, you know, under helping families. And so with the SMBF population, a lot of times we forget to focus on our family members, but the family members are what we need in order to make us stronger. So we have to make sure they're getting the appropriate care too and all kind of assistance, behavior health assistance that they may need. So um, I'm looking forward to talking to some of the vendors that I saw information about and see can you know we collaborate or even you know get someone to you know some of you to join our team because we want to make sure that we um, 
as Louisiana, we're helping everybody, not just our service members, not just our veterans, but our families. Like I said, a lot of times we forget about the families, but it is something very important and it's needed. So um, I know I was very quick um, in seeing what we were doing with the Louisiana Challenge. Um, so far, we've had meetings um, starting from February um, up into now. We went through a virtual policy training. And so within the, the policy training, we're learning our ways like in with, within Louisiana, how we can combat this suicide you know, issue and come up with ways where certain things can be mandated and we could work together as a group to you know make this world better and to make a world this world better places don't forget about you know we can't forget about our service members and our veterans because so often once we're released into the world once we retire or once we you know um we complete our you know duty obligation then we're left in the world and we got to make sure, because I, I myself, you know, I feel like, you know, once I got off active duty, I didn't feel like I had the appropriate connections. But by, you know, working with different people, um, by working with, you know, veterans and working with veterans, working in veteran services, I met a lot of people. And I myself can say that it helped me because overall, I was working with homeless veterans. And this just is a personal test, personal testimony. And I was working with homeless veterans, and I realized through th them, my clients, that I needed help myself. So that made me, you know, think about it. Hey, you know, if they could come to me and tell me about their problems, then I should be able to do the same. And how can I help them with their problems if I'm not handling the things that's you know, that's bothering me. So, um, like I said, this very suicide prevention is something very dear to me. And we think about like all the people who talk about, you know, oh, you know, out, you know, I, you know, suicide, I had, you know, I had an issue with it or whatever, but we don't talk about the people who suffer in silence. So we have to make sure we combat this that as a whole to make sure that we're reaching out to everybody that we don't let anyone fall behind. So um, if you have any questions, you know, please feel, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you want to join any of our collaborative teams, the mayor, the, um, the, the governor's challenge or our SMB collaborative team, please, you know, please reach out to me because I mean, we need people and everyone brings a certain skill set to this team and I appreciate everyone. Thank you. Tasha, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the work that you're doing um, with the Governor's Suicide Prevention Challenge. And listen, I was looking at the chat and uh, you got somebody that actually wanna join. So let me ask you a question. Uh, your last assignment in the military, how many, how many soldiers did you have under you? Um, about 30 about 30. And so you retired and went into a volunteer job where you got how many now? 40? And it's about to be 41 because I see yes. somebody say they interested. Oh, you got yes. two. So, you know, you you have more people now uh, that, that you have to, to, to watch out for and lead than you did in the military. But I can tell you, it goes to show the, um, the, the dedication that Latasha has for assisting veterans. You know, 20 years in the military is a long time you know, to serve and then for you to retire and continue to serve veterans, it is absolutely a beautiful thing. And I have to tell you, we truly appreciate everything that you do because as a team member, I know I, my first thought is, hey, let's just go to Latasha. Let's see what Latasha said, you know. Um, so thank you so much, Latasha. I truly appreciate it. And now we will get on to our final speaker, um, Brigadier General. Michael A. Cushman served 37 years in the United States Air Force. Among many assignments, his last prior to retirement was the Air National Guard Assistant to the National Reconnaissance Office or the NRO. Um, one of our country's uh, intelligence agencies. 
He was the principal advisor to the Undersecretary of the Air Force and the director of the NRO on all reserve forces matters. The general currently serves as the military veterans advisor to the 22nd Judicial District Court here in Louisiana Veterans Court, in addition to several allied programs and organizations in support of veterans in need. And I can tell you that General Cushman is an absolute advocate for our veterans. But here's the important thing to note, not just our veterans, but our incarcerated veterans. And we do have programs here at the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs, and it actually is an incarcerated veterans program, but it is very special for somebody like the general to take a part of members of our population that often we look past and we may say, hey, you know, you committed the crime, you have to do the time. But the general understands that there are circumstances surrounding everything. And he works with our incarcerated veterans and he is here to talk to you about veterans court and how it literally changes lives of veterans. And before the general gets started, Colonel Strickland. Just wanna let the uh, all the folks know that the general uh, has just been appointed by the governor to the military family uh, review uh, committee, uh, uh, the, the military uh, re review committee that uh, supports veterans with uh, that are in financial distress. And we're honored to have him as a member of, of that great committee. So uh, let's everybody welcome General Cushman, my good friend, sir. Six seconds to live. What we didn't know at the time and only learned a couple of days later was that one of our security cameras, which was damaged initially in the blast, recorded some of the suicide attacks. It happened exactly as the Iraqis had described it. It took exactly six seconds from when the truck entered the alley until it detonated. You can watch the last six seconds of their young lives. It probably took about a second for the two Marines to separately come to the same conclusion about what was going to happen once the truck came into their view at the far end of the alley. Exactly no time to talk it over or to call the sergeant to ask what they should do. Only enough time to take half an instant and think about what the sergeant told them to do only a few minutes before. Let no unauthorized personnel or vehicles pass. The two Marines had about five seconds left to live. It took maybe another two seconds for them to present their weapons, take aim, and open up. By this time, the truck was halfway through the barriers and gaining speed the whole time. Here, the recording shows several Iraqi, Iraqi police some of whom had, who had fired their AKs now scattering like the normal and rational men they were, some running right past the Marine. They had three seconds left to live. For another two seconds more, the recording shows the Marines' weapons firing nonstop, the truck's windshield exploding into shards of glass as their rounds take it apart and pour into the body of the SOBs who were trying to get past them to kill their brothers, American and Iraqi, bedded down in the barracks, totally unaware of the fact that their lives at that moment depended entirely on two Marines standing their ground. If they had been aware, they would have known they were safe because two Marines stood between them and a crazed suicide bomber. The recording shows the truck careening to a stop immediately in front of the two Marines. In all of the instantaneous violence, Corporal Jonathan Yale, 22, and Lance Corporal Jordan Harder, 20, never hesitated. By all reports and by the recording, they never stepped back. They never even started to step aside. They never even shifted their weight. With their feet spread shoulder width apart, they leaned into the danger, firing as fast as they could work their weapons. They only had one second left to live. The truck explodes, the camera goes blank, two young men go to their God, six seconds. Not enough time to think about their families, their country, their flag, or about their lives or their deaths, but more than enough time for two very brave young men to do their duty into eternity. This is an account of a suicide bombing in Iraq 
in 2008. This is but one story of the kind of soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, Coast Guardsmen who are watched all over the world today for each one of us here today. Good morning. 23 years ago, a district judge up in uh, Buffalo, New York, started a movement that has now become a structured veteran-centric court model that differs um, significantly from the traditional judge, prosecutor, defense, jury model. Today, there are over 400 veterans treatment courts in the United States. These courts provide the resources to treat mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction, while the veteran acquires new skills to accomplish recovery and sobriety. These courts also provide quick access to VA benefits, services, and care, plus education, training, and employment. But here's another distinction <clears throat> between the traditional and the veteran court. Because the veterans courts are discipline specific team required to deal with the complex needs of the veteran. Our experience is that 90% of justice involved veterans have one or more conditions such as co-medical morbidity, PTSD, substance abuse, mood disorder, complex trauma, and even traumatic brain injury. A large percentage have gone through multiple combat, uh, combat deployments. And in order to address this combat challenge, each veteran has a specific recovery plan and a treatment program which is monitored with the assistance of the court's team all designed to ensure accountability in terms of scheduled treatment sessions, endless appointments, prescribed meds, drug and alcohol testing, the terms, you know, compliance with the terms of their probation uh, and compliance with what the court expect, uh, expects from them, which is attendance at regular court appearances and a whole slug more. Another key component of veterans courts is the assignment of a volunteer veteran who serves as a mentor for the program participants. The mentor and the veteran are paired up uh, as to the branch of service, similar experiences. The 22nd Judicial District currently has 28 veteran volunteer mentors. The benefits of successful veterans court, what are they? Well, uh, if you complete, you may include, it may include reduction in terms of probation, uh, dismissal of criminal charges and reduced or suspended incarceration. The program typically runs anywhere from 18 to 24 months and in some cases, a lot longer. The 22nd Judicial District serves St. Tammany and Washington parishes with a veterans court for veterans who are currently facing prosecution for one or more criminal cases. It's a four-phase program designed to divert veterans from the traditional criminal justice process and instead of putting them in jail, we put them into rehabilitative treatment with a high degree of accountability. The program is highly structured with built-in discipline and accountability and I'm proud to be associated with Honorable Judge Raymond Childress, who has presided over the Veterans Court since its inception in April of 2017. Been in business now four and a half years. The judges team meets weekly. Listen to this. We meets weekly to review the veterans' individual uh, progress and status. In addition to the judge, the team consists of a, a program director, a case manager, two assistant district attorneys, both of which are veterans, a public defender who is a veteran, three felony and misdemeanor uh, probation officers, two of whom are veterans, treatment providers from Covington Behavioral Health, can't say enough about them, and Florida Parishes, a, a fine, a fine uh, treatment provider for us, a military veteran advisor who's a veteran, a mentor coordinator who coordinates these 28 uh, uh, mentors, he's a veteran, a NAMI uh, peer support specialist who's a veteran, the US VA Justice Outreach Coordinator, and the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs Assistance Counselor who is also a veteran. 
most of listen to that most of these most of these staff do not receive additional compensation for their time devoted to veterans sport. They volunteer their time extra. All these people that are associated with the justice system all have full dockets of criminal and misdemeanor on top of what they do for veterans sport. Over the past four and a half years, the 22nd JDC has, cons has considered over 200 plus potential candidates for veterans sport. And during this period, 89 veterans have been selected to participate. At, a given, at any given time, our court is working with about 30 veterans at a time and their families spread over the four phases of the program. 38 veterans have now successfully completed veterans court and of those three were rearrested on new charges. Others who did not complete the program were either revoked for non-compliance or where they were administratively or medically discharged. But what about the family? Between the veterans themselves, plus if you make a modest estimate of what an average size family would look like, we're dealing with well over 200 lives at any given point in this program. These vulnerable combat veterans who are in veterans court have all broken the law, been arrested, jailed, and hit bottom, usually with horrendous impact on these families. And if you consider extended family members and close friends and co-workers, the numbers of those affected by a single veteran caught up in the justice system increase exponentially. Our veterans court is supported by a stunning team of partners. The National Association of Drug Court Professionals uh, provides us with training and evidence-based standards so that we are in compliance with best practices. The Justice for, Justice for Vets is a branch of the NADCP, and they provide specific training for veterans court. National Drug Court Institute provides grants for treatment providers. Uh, SAMHSA that you heard about earlier, earlier, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a branch of the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, they provide the big grant that allows us to uh, function. And then at the, at the local uh, Louisiana, Louisiana has the Louisiana Drug and Specialty Court Professional. Louisiana Works helped us get jobs. United, the, the, the Louisiana Supreme Court provides guidance and a little bit of money. They supplement us with, with some funding. Coming to Behavior Health, Florida Parishes, Treatment. NAMI support, supplies the uh, veteran uh, peer support. The North Shore Court Foundation engages in public education so that people understand, and our citizens understand what veteran sports all about. And they do uh, provide some uh, funds for needs that the Veterans Court has that are not covered by grants. And I can't say enough about the, the, the Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs. With their incarcerated vets program, with their uh, veterans assistance counselors, the military family assistance fund, but most of all, the leadership that comes from Baton Rouge is is just marvelous and always there when we call. We love our community partners. We're often asked, how do you measure success on a program like Veterans Court? Well, the easy answer is you just keep track of recidivism rate. In our program, here's the answer. In the past uh, four and a half years, three veterans have been rearrested on new charges. But you know what? There's another way to measure success. On graduation day, the veterans and the families come together to participate in a formal commencement ceremony. It's a gorgeous ceremony to behold. If you are in attendance, you will witness the graduates as they acknowledge and express individually their appreciation for what they went through. You will hear the highs and the lows of their expectations versus true life experiences. You will hear about their periods of darkness centered by the blinding brightness of light and hope. You will hear their recurring temptation to give up and their resolution to fight on. <clears throat> you will hear that the, their satisfaction, if not exuberance 
of successes along the way, their fear of despair, that they can put a claim on one soul. And at the end, you will witness the rise of the warrior within them to persevere. And finally, at a graduation ceremony, when you hear from the family members, you will know what success actually means. Families truly reunited. I want to offer sincere and, and, and deep appreciation to Secretary and Colonel Joey Strickland, to Deputy Secretary Julie Baxter Payne, and Veterans Outreach Program Director Larry Williams for their kind invitation to be with all of you on this fourth annual summit. I have to say, in listening to uh, some of the community providers, sometimes labeled as vendors, and, and the other speakers, it, for me, it's truly humbling to be, as we say in New Orleans, in that number. But one more thought. At the 22nd JDC, we firmly believe that we are helping to prevent suicide among our veterans' heroes. So gracious thanks to our partners and dedicated staff. Please consider this. You know, just look around. There are Jonathan Yates and Jordan Harders all around us, and indeed among us. All of you here present, those that were part of the program and those that took the time to register and listen to this uh, summit, your colleagues that weren't able to be here today all have in common a past and continuing commitment that that elevates, picture this as a vision, that elevates service to our country and those who defend her. We can say this because of your untiring dedication to work on solutions to this crisis of veteran suicide. And so this summit is really a bright spark in the flame of pride that burns across Louisiana. Each of us here present should feel this collective pride as we continue this mission. May God continue to bless each of you and your families. God bless our troops. God bless our veterans. And God bless America. General, thank you so much um, for all that you do. It is truly appreciated. And um, as I said in the beginning, uh, before you started speaking, it takes a special person to work with our veterans who have infracted the law, but understanding that also they are people and they face their own mental health challenges. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm sure that you have saved a lot of lives and prevented suicide with the hard work uh, that you're doing with the 22nd JDC. And it is uh, very much appreciated. And I would implore anybody on the call to reach out to the general, um, because there are opportunities for veterans to assist with the veterans court, because I believe there are mentorship opportunities that these incarcerated veterans uh, must have mentors as well to complete the program. So if you are interested, uh, please reach out uh, to General Cushman. And again, sir, thank you so much. And what I'll do now is I will implore anybody who has a question to go ahead and post it in the, uh, in the Q&A because we are coming up to the end of the summit. So again, if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A because we're coming up on the end of the summit. And with that, uh, I will say thank you, General Cushman, Colonel Strickland, Latasha Shepard, Lori Guillory, Dr. Raymond Tucker. Uh, thank you to all of our vendors and everybody can bring their camera back up, uh, please. Thank you to all of our vendors, our guest panelists, Cheryl, Brandy Patrick, our communications director, Zachariah Brewer for uh, providing the invocation. And of equal importance, I wanna thank those in attendance. Um, as the general said, um, your support is uh, paramount uh, in suicide prevention. And just the very fact that you are here today shows that uh, you truly care about preventing suicide. And you also wanna do something about the problems that we face. So I wanna thank you for your time and for all that you do. Uh, one quick admin note, everybody will get a copy of the vendor slides. You will get a copy of the link for YouTube, our Louisiana Department of Veterans Affairs YouTube page, where we will upload this summit 
for later viewing. And also you will get a copy of all of the contacts that have been placed in the chat. You will get that as well. And even though this year's summit uh, is not CEU approved, if you would like a certificate of attendance, just send me an email, larry.williams at la.gov. Again, larry.williams at la.gov. And also my email address is in the, um, in the email that you got to enter this summit. And I will send you a certificate of uh, participation for this summit. And as with any military operation, uh, I'm gonna turn it over as we have some questions coming in uh, to Colonel Strickland for our final remarks, sir. Thank you, uh, Larry. Uh, that was a really fine job that you did hosting this summit. Uh, I wanna thank all the speakers that, uh, that made remarks and uh, really appreciate you participating in this summit. We're gonna continue to do this every year uh, at least for the next two and a half years that I'm the secretary, and then I'm hoping that it continues uh, uh, in perpetuity. Uh, I want to thank the dedication of people like Chris Flanagan, who's listening from his truck. I think Linda Couch is listening from her car. These are, these, these are people that are truly dedicated, and I want to thank uh, all of you for supporting this department, and especially for supporting Louisiana's nearly 300,000 veterans. Uh, it takes all of us to do this work, not just me or not just the general, but it takes everybody, it takes all of you. So uh, let's, let's commit ourselves to our, our veterans, to our state and to our citizens, and let's move forward and take care of business. Thank you guys. Thank you, sir. I truly appreciate it. And uh, in light of uh, what's going on around our state um, with, with, with the aftermath of the hurricane, and we still under, um, uh, COVID still has a grip on us. I will ask um, Evangelist Brewer to uh, please close out the summit with a prayer, sir, if you don't mind. Right. Thank you, Lord, for bringing everybody here for uh, the fact that this all worked out, the fact that uh, we didn't have any glitches or uh, anybody Zoom bombing uh, to mess up everything going on. Uh, thank you for Larry, Colonel Strickland, for everybody who's uh, come here to present. General Cushman, Laura Carey, Chris Renard, James, Eric Dutchy, Linda, Cheryl Brandy, Chris, Latasha, and uh, Laura and Deanna and everybody else, uh, anybody I missed as well. I thank you that uh, you're going to keep everybody safe as they go forth. I thank you for the answers that people are looking for, uh, the questions being answered to God, and help us, just every single one of us, in every way that we can to, to be used by you to I uh, give you the glory you deserve in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Zacharias. Truly appreciate it. So at this time, um, we are still recording. And what I'll do is um, I will hang out for another two minutes um, just to make sure I don't see really any questions coming in. Somebody did ask me um, if you're going to get a copy of a list of the speakers. And uh, I saw Brandy address that. But yeah, I will go ahead. I will go ahead and add a list of the speakers um, to that uh, to that email as well. So at this point, um, I'll continue to let the thank yous come in uh, because the uh, the audience can't speak. But uh, thank you all for attending. You know, we really appreciate it. At one point, we were up to um, ninety two attendees, so a very good turnout, and uh, we appreciate everybody. Uh, that showed up. George Haas, uh, thank you so much for being here. See you out there. Jaysha Blocker, really appreciate it. And everybody's support. Thank you all. Is that it, Larry? Uh, yes, sir. You can go ahead and log off. It's perfectly fine. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you, Colonel. Okay. All right, guys.